tedious, tedious notes. It's more than just I kind of looked at the minutes for the last yeah. Um, we are recording your carbon now. We just started. That's uh, right. Marco was sits here for like 20 minutes waiting for that recording to upload. So I need to remember, <laughs> need to, remember to do that afterwards. Thanks, Chris. David, David should be here. Yeah, we still, it's only 6.01. So we'll, we'll give everybody a couple of minutes. Richard, are you getting my emails? Because, yeah. okay, I keep getting a bounce back. But then when I double check, it's like the one that gets bounced back is the same one that I also forwarded it to. Uh, so. Yeah, I haven't. Everything you said, even the one you sent me last time, saying it bounced back. I had the one that it exactly. said bounced back. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> My Gmail does that sometimes too, so it might be that I'm not recognized as a contact or something. Maybe I'll have to fix that. Yeah, it's okay. I just won't. I'll just assume you're getting them. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you put some kind of a uh, tracking mechanism on it, I'll probably get it. <laughs> I do have a, my system kicks out tracking. So. Oh, okay, that, that might be it. That might be it. Hey, grab your nameplate. Hi, George. Hi, George. Hey. Uh, yes, I don't, I don't, Mark Safely. Yeah, I don't, I We better take an action tonight. We got a lot of members. I know. Well, it's, we've got all the newbies and everything. You can at least improve your minutes. That's right. There we go. <laughs> That's That's least, if nothing else. That is big. That's a whole other thing. Thanks for opening that can of worms. Um, so, you know, I think what we can do is go ahead and get started on introductions. Um, and maybe what we'll do is we'll start with the existing members. That way, if David shows up a little bit late, he won't have missed out. So, do you want to get started? Sure. Linda Jane. Um, I don't know what oh, I have to, to make this cute. Okay, no, no, wait. Okay. So, oh, introduce Lord. yourself and. Um, Tell us, just tell us your favorite animal. <laughs> yeah. My favorite animal is a hippo. Wow. Good. I like to some Okay. The reason why is because um, I'm originally from South Sudan, and hippos are native to my homeland and our tribe, so they're very, <laughs> um, they're beautiful, but they're vicious. I was saying, but I like them. Aggressive. They're very like aggressive. Have you heard about Lou, the hippo that is now a Florida citizen down at Homestack the Spring? I, I, really, have you, I want to get down there to see to meet Lou. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll just we'll hopscotch with the existing members and then we'll go back around to the to the new members. Um, and then I'll introduce the speakers. So I am uh, George Capati. Um, I've been a member since I think 2013, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm an oldie. Um, I've enjoyed it. It's been really rewarding. Um, I couldn't think of nothing on it. You know, I just enjoy it so much. There's so many things that have to be done. And your favorite animal? All right. Fish. All right. Or the entertainment that catching them and figuring out how to catch them uh, horses. Jay Rosenbeck, I've uh, just started my second year. My favorite animal is the mushroom. Yeah. Why? Because okay. <laughs> uh, they, when I was growing up, were in drainage ditches behind my house, and they provided all kinds of entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Well, I'm not technically a member. I'm the liaison, so I'm here to support you, to keep things moving along, make sure we all stay civilized and polite, um, get you the information you need, the bathrooms. Um, my name is Summer Waters, and um, yeah, just, just taking over as liaison. Um, my background, um, I'm, a, I'm like a hybrid, I like to say. My undergraduate was in biology from the University of South Florida, and then I did my graduate work in engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and I focused on my degrees in civil, but my focus was really water and environmental. And so... It's a very good school. But... It is, it is. It's definitely one of the top in the country. Is the University of Colorado. No way. Yes. Can we do a fist bump across the table? I mean, <laughs> I did not know that. I did not cold, know that. <laughs> so I've been back and forth a lot. I worked for a number of years in the Panhandle um, after graduate school and then went back out west and worked in uh, worked for the county of San Diego. And then I worked for Cooperative Extension in Arizona and then worked in a water quality lab, managed the water quality program in Colorado and then made my way back down here. Um, I had a brief stint working for state parks in the Panhandle when I first came down here, but I just, my love for the springs, I used to call down to this district, to talk to them about how they manage their springs compared to how we were managing ours up there. I'm connected with the Springs Institute and just came down here and 
went swimming in one of these big springs. And I, I just couldn't even imagine my life anymore without access to those springs. I, mean, I just could never imagine it. So, um, welcome everybody, and let's go around with the sure. hands. Oh, shoot. I have to say, I know I'm going to be lame and say dog because I didn't used to be a dog person, and now I'm a total dog person. I have a dog that is just my first big dog you know, puppy, and it's just such a companion. I had no idea. I thought about growing up, we kind of had dogs, but I never bonded with them. And my family used to say that I was not a dog person. So now I have one that I really like, and I'm just going to go ahead and go with it. He's my buddy. Um, I'm Holly Florence. Um, I was born and raised in Gainesville. Um, so was my mother. I'm actually fifth generation Floridian, which is kind of rare in Florida. <laughs> to be from Florida, and all your family's from Florida, and you're really from Florida. Um, we own Florence Recycling and Disposal. It's on the southeast side of town. We have um, roll-off containers for construction and demolition trash. We also own a landfill and transfer station in Gainesville, uh, just for construction trash. Um, my parents started it 35 years ago with their first landfill in Archer. When I was a kid, I was homeschooled. I, do my lessons in the morning and then go play in the trash in the afternoons. <laughs> so without uh, a helmet, right? Yeah. No helmet. No helmet. <laughs> I, I know a lot about trash. My friends affectionately call me the trash queen of Gainesville and send me selfies of dumpsters when they're on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I get a lot of trash jokes and I don't mind. Grew up trashy, still trashy. <laughs> <laughs> Family's trashy, we're just trash. trash. <laughs> Florida trash at that. Oh, no. uh, that is next level. Yeah. Uh, so my my mom's retired. She kind of fired herself a few years ago. She was done with it. Dad comes in hit and miss when he feels like it more more than not. And so I'm running the place. My brother works there. My uncle works there. My husband works with us. So we're just a big family business trying to take care of construction trash in town. Um, I think that my animal would be fish too. We do a lot of fishing. We, we have airboats and um, places out of Crystal River and Cedar Key. And I love fishing, trout and redfish and the fun ones that fight back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. And your favorite animal? The fish. Yeah. Really? Yeah, That's I love fishing. Too. It's not a raccoon. I would fish all the time. I would think, yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> raccoon. Oh my god. Oh, it took me a minute. <laughs> Your turn, Helen. Okay. I'm Helen Schultz. And um, I'm new to this group. New, fairly new to games, so I've only been here three and a half years. I live. In Wyoming, I worked for the Forest Service in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. I lived in Arizona. I lived in California. My son lives in Denver right now. Okay. So I can, and I was originally born in Germany, lived in Switzerland, lived in England. I lived in different places. My favorite animal is the warthog. Mm, wow. wow. I'm going to have to go to the zoo. When you ask me when I go to the zoo, I always have to go visit. They are the coolest animals. <laughs> Cool. I'm Richard Wilhelm. Uh, I was in the military for eight years. Finally got through with that brainwash. Um, came out here and uh, became a nurse, retired, and found myself looking for something to keep me from isolating too much. So, <laughs> so I started joining committees, and so far it's been a real boon. So happy to be here. My favorite animal is the pelican. Because he has the best of all worlds. He gets to fly, he gets to swim, he eats lots of fish, and, <laughs> and he can be on land. So, I mean, the guys just got it all. No, that's true. They really are neat. They have the hollow bones, right? <laughs> yeah. That is neat. So, um, these are some familiar faces you probably see around quite a bit, but Steve, you want to do an introduction? Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm Steve Foster. I'm the department director for the environment. Um, I was the liaison for about five years for the, for the group, so um, I you know, really appreciate what you all do, and I hope you get a lot out of this. We get a lot from you all, and the input you, you give us as a department, so I really appreciate that. I, I um, knew with the department since 2003, so I just hit my 20-year mark. Um, before that, I'm a native Floridian, but I'm a first-generation American, kind of interesting. Um, and 
my dad was a professor at Miami for 37 years, so I spent my time in, in Wetland Ecology, so I spent my time walking through wetlands and Everglades um, most of my life. Um, my favorite um, animal is probably the screech owl. It was one of the birds I studied in graduate school. It's small but fierce. Um, <laughs> and, by the way, they can catch fish. They seem to like leeches, which oh, that is a good thing. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where do they find those? Is that the back of the bottom? They can't back of the bottom. They they hunt um, across creek beds, so they're sitting and watching. So when they come up to the surface mm -hmm. of the water, oh wow, yeah, they're smaller. Small. Yeah. And they make that pleasant sound. They do. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Have, have a seat. Um, like you might have a name a name plate up there to grab. Yes. Sure. <laughs> we're, we're just kind of finishing up introductions, but you got here just in time. So we'll, we'll have you go over next. Uh, Christopher Gilbert. I'm the uh, Hazardous Materials Program Manager for uh, the department. I've uh, been with the Environmental Protection Department for 22 years, just last weekend, and that. Uh, before that uh, former life, I'm originally from Canada. Uh, I am the first in my family to become American, and that we worked many years up in the Great White North. I've been all the way up to almost the North Pole in the Arctic Circle, oh and that I worked for the DOT uh, and covered all of northwestern Ontario. Uh, which is the largest province. It takes you three days to drive across it just to get out of it. Uh, and of course, uh, volunteer, I definitely appreciate uh, y'all coming up and volunteering. My background is uh, volunteer fire rescue. Uh, and that uh, I rose all the way to fire chief, fire college instructor, tactical flight paramedic. Uh, and they can really use you up there right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I worked a lot of fire, wildfires. My, uh, one of our smaller ones was 84 miles long by 32 miles wide. Wow. We don't talk acres, we talk miles. Right? Wow. And, uh, and uh, technically, there's a lot of different animals you can like, especially in Canada. And that, but uh, uh, I found a really friendly one in Australia called the uh, Kuoka. It's the happiest animal on the planet. <laughs> no, it's not a koala, it's a Kuoka. Oh, yes. We've, right. like no, we've had this discussion. Right. right. You were going to put one in your suitcase. <laughs> now I remember. Otherwise, it would be the Wolverine because that this thing is, is angry. Chris Gilbert. Take any yeah. 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 Um, this is Chris Gilbert, our presenter. Okay, we'll give him another introduction. Great, great. So uh, we, we've kind of gone around and, and done introductions, yeah, but yeah. since we've got a couple um, new folks, let's have you introduce yourselves. And what we're doing is just uh, saying our favorite animal. Favorite animal. After your brief introduction, yes. Uh, Jan Franson, I, I'm, I'll be going. There you go. See, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to let you go. Yeah. 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 Please do. Yes, yeah. I was really starting to do that. I would have been here about 10 minutes <laughs> later, but I took an airplane over. Low flying. Oh, goodness. Okay, so go ahead and do introductions, and then you can take over the meeting from there. Okay. Yep, my name is David Morris, and I've been on this committee for, gee, I can't remember that far back, <laughs> about 10 years, something like that. Um, it's a great committee, and we have the greatest staff in the world. No one could help to have something, someone better than than Summer. And we still have our director of EPD here today, um, Stephen Hofstadter. So, well, you're gonna you're gonna love being on this committee. Do you want to do a, a quick go around yeah, of yeah. names? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's we'll just go ahead. Linda, James, uh, Holly, Florence, Holly, George, Dan Franson, <laughs> oh. Ella Scholl, Jay Rosen. Which will help. Okay, great. And then on the line here, are you still awake? Corbin? My escape wasn't that wasn't that smooth. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Do you want to do a quick introduction and sure? Uh, Corbin Hansen, I'm with the county attorney's office, and I'm here to uh, give a presentation on the Sunshine Law. And your favorite animal? Oh. Um I guess besides people, uh, raccoons. <laughs> really? You like people? Yeah. People are all right. 
That's the first person I've ever known to cl claim people as their favorite animal. Yeah. He's, he's, he's an attorney. No, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> he fell off a different tree. I get it. Not, not all the people. You know, there's some good ones, though. <laughs> hey, by the way, rather than risk his favor with, with Corbin, <laughs> um, I've had to work with Corbin a couple of times on some things, and he's, he's also very, very excellent to work with. We, we all couldn't live in a better county than this, though, so I, I don't know if any, if I, right now I'm having trouble with the SOE, so I may, be, I may put them off the list and somewhere else, but basically, this is just a very great place to work. Um, before we go any farther, I want to apologize to everyone, and especially to, uh, um, to Summer in, in front of everyone. Uh, I did so privately last week, but I was a jerk last week's meeting. I, I, I knew what I wanted to get done, and I think we accomplished that, but I did it in such a horrible way that I, you know, um, I feel bad about that, and I feel it requires an apology to everyone who happened to have been here, and especially to uh, to Summer. So, um, and with that, we'll move on. Um, looks like we've got a quorum tonight. Please keep coming to these meetings in person. We need to do some things. We need to be able to make some recommendations to the uh, Board of County Commissioners. We can't do that unless we're all here and making, you know, some. Uh, it, you know, some great decisions and as well as, you know, putting together some recommendations that we send to them, you know, in a formal manner. And they, by the way, they do read, you know, the recommendations we send to them and other that other committees send to them and they take them into consideration. Well, I have seen them change their, you know, to swivel a major degree away from what they plan to do based upon suggestions that we've made. Okay. So we need to keep that up. Um, and, uh, uh, does anyone have any changes they want to make to the agenda? I know that's okay. I think someone did a perfect job on this agenda this week. So I, I always have something to pick about an agenda and I really can't. Everything is in the right order and, you know, we have everything we need on there. Um, uh, the minutes, most of you all weren't here last week and I think we'd have so many abstentions that, you know, I don't know what we're going to do about that, but we, we yeah. really need, you know, has anyone had a chance to go through the minutes here? That is here. Last week's were pretty, the last ones were pretty brief because I was taking them. Um, but Tina's are a little longer because I have the yeah. May ones in yeah. there because she just got those to me the day before yesterday. Yeah. So then Holly's taking notes tonight for us. Okay, so we need to have someone make a motion then to accept them. Chair does in this committee does not typically make motions on. I move we accept the minutes. I second. Okay, the minutes have been uh, uh, seconded and we have a. Uh, I I think is there any discussion on them next? Not hearing any, the minutes are passed and accepted as they are. Um, next item here is new member welcome. We've done the new member welcomes, and uh, but under that we have what's very important, and that's the Sunshine Law Overview. I've listened to this a number of times. Pay attention closely. It's really important. You can get fined if you do something outside of that. And believe me, when I first came on this committee, I, the idea of not being able to talk to someone else, that, you know, about something really just struck me as weird, but it's Florida law and we got to abide by it. Corbin, you want to take over? Sure. I have a uh, presentation that you've probably seen many, many times, David, and I've given many, many times. Um, go ahead and find. All right. Is that showing up for everybody? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there's my contact information, Corbin Hansen with the Alaska County Attorney's Office. That's my phone number. And, and what I'll ask is, obviously, if you've got questions between now and the end of the presentation, feel free to ask them, feel free to, to stop me. Um, I, I'll give you kind of a right off the bat, there are a lot of nuances to what we're going to discuss. So what I'm, what I typically plan on doing, or what I typically do, is give a relatively high level discussion about government in the sunshine. I'm not looking to get into each potential uh, pitfall or factual issue, but if you wanna go through some of them, we can. Um, what I do ask is that if you have a particular issue pop up and David's taken, taken me up on this in the past, you can either um, call that number and I will go ahead and give you a call back or pick it up if I'm there um, or email me. And my email address is C, as in Corbin, F Hansen at alachuacounty.us. 
And that would allow you to um, say, hey, I didn't want to bring this up in a group, but I have an issue with uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So we can move right ahead. And um, like I said, if anybody wants to stop me, I can't really see everybody. So, uh, you know, flagging me down might not work, but if you want to just make a noise or something, I'll try to, I'll try to pay attention. There we go. So. Oh. Actually, people moving and talking. So, uh, there are two things in this presentation. I, I'm probably going to throw in a third somewhere in here. We're going to deal with the Sunshine Law and we're going to deal with voting conflicts. I don't know if anybody, uh, any of the new members, have ever been on a Sunshine Board. So, for all the old members, potentially for some of the new members, this might feel a little, um, a little high level. A little bit of a, you know, why are you giving us the basics? We know these things, but I'm going to try to give you all the information that you do need going forward. Uh, the, the topic that I'll throw in is public records and give a pretty brief overview of that as well. So when you get into the Sunshine Law, you're dealing not only with the Florida Constitution, but also Florida statutes. And I'll leave this up here for a minute. I don't want to have to read it to you, but the crux of it is government in a fishbowl, that meetings of a government body, including advisory boards, are open to the public and they meet certain requirements uh, to be open to the public. They have to be noticed, they have to be in uh, a building that is, that is open both physically and psychologically. Uh, we can get into some of those examples in a little bit. Uh, and then you have Florida Statute Section 286.011 that implements this concept that's found in the Florida Constitution saying the overarching goal in Florida is that your government, particularly your local government in this case, is conducted transparently and accessibly to anybody who wants to come and participate. So the basic requirements that we're going to talk about is the public business must be conducted in a public meeting. Um, they must be open to the public. You're currently in a building that's open to the public. We make sure that doors are unlocked. We try to you know, put signs if we can saying meeting this way. Uh, a lot of this are things that you aren't going to have to worry about because staff takes care of it. Staff make sure that these meetings are held in, in an appropriate place, that they're noticed, but we're still going to go over them. Reasonable notice of such meetings must be given. What is reasonable really depends. It's not specifically spelled out. We typically aim for at least seven to 10 days where we, we give notice of a meeting that's going to happen. In emergencies, you can do less. Um, typically, an advisory board is not, is not going to be operating on emergency issues. So we're going to stick to our seven to 10 goal. Um, the idea being that we want people to be able to check the county website, say, hey, there's an EPAC meeting. I, I can't wait to go. And, and they know where it is, what time it is, and how to get there. Minutes of the meeting must be taken and promptly recorded. So those are the, the minutes that Summer was just talking about, the notes of the meeting that are then adopted. They're supposed to capture the official actions of the board. They're supposed to capture relevant discussions. It doesn't have to be a, a verbatim transcript. It doesn't have to be something where you can go back and say in it, you know, minute 36, so-and-so said this. But you need to be able to, if you're a member of the public, understand the gist of what happened in that meeting when you look at the minutes. And there has to be an opportunity for public comment. But, and that's going to get spelled out a little bit uh, later as well. But if any member of the public sees the notice, says, I'd like to attend that meeting, comes in, when a motion occurs, we want to make sure that people are actually given an opportunity to speak on the actions of this advisory board. This is just a, a lot of times people assume that because advisory boards are just that, they're advisory, that they're not covered by the Sunshine Law and that perhaps it's there's a little more flexibility. That's not how courts have um, interpreted it. That's not how uh, the state has interpreted it. So advisory boards are just as subject to the Sunshine Law as something like the county commission would be. Uh, we have a couple of sections in here where uh, we're talking about public officers, employees. This is really just the, the overarching theme in Florida that there is a certain ethical standard of transparency that 
the different members of the, the public and different members of the governing bodies, which include you as advisory board members, have to be held to. A public officer includes any person appointed to hold office. Uh, it could be members of advisory boards, depending on whether or not they have some sort of final decision making authority. Um, this gets back to the idea of open government and the goals. Um, we want to have that we want to have the ability to retrace the steps of how a decision was made so that we have the accountability and it's intended to promote that trust in in government. So here is where we get into some of the more nuancy details that affect you as advisory board members. The Sunshine Law applies to meetings. Well, right at the outset, the question is, what is a meeting? A meeting for purposes of the Sunshine Law is when two or more members of the same committee or advisory board discuss any matter that may foreseeably come before their committee for action. It could be a telephone call, an email, a text. It could be somebody saying, hey, I am thinking about um, bringing this up at the next meeting. Summer, can, can you tell David that I'm going to bring this up at the next meeting and here's my position? It could be using a third party to, to try to work around those limitations on, on discussions. So there's a couple things to break down. Um, this is you know, what does not constitute a meeting. If you're talking to members of different committees, if you're talking to alternate members, if you're talking to Summer, Steve, Chris, Mark, anybody who is staff is not me, uh, is not on the committee themselves, and you can have open and free discussions outside of these public meetings. Let me go back up here. So looking at the things that are underlined there, and it's it's been a little while since I've given this, so this might come up later. We might we might get a little repetitive here, but uh, you're looking at what is a matter that might foreseeably come before the committee. This is the Environmental Protection Advisory Committee. You have a fairly broad scope of what might come before you, but there are a lot of things that won't or, or aren't necessarily foreseeable to come before you. If you get into um, a discussion with anybody in this room about affordable housing matters or veterans affairs or any of those types of issues, it's there might be some you know, potential discussion that happens at EPAC about those matters, but it's not really foreseeable that it's going to come before this board. If you're talking about natural resource protections or you know, climate vulnerability analyses, um, sustainable, sustainable development, those kinds of things are really, I think, reasonably foreseeable to come back to EPAC. So if you look around the room and you see another member of this committee and the conversation naturally just shifts to um, resiliency in the face of climate change, that kind of thing. That's that should really be a red flag for you to stop that conversation and immediately say, well, you know, we can't have this conversation outside of this public meeting. And the idea behind there is I know that it's asking a lot for members of the public who obviously have a passion about this particular issue to say, well, I'm not gonna to speak to these other 10 people about this issue, but it's part of the sacrifice that's made in addition to your time when you serve here, but also being a part of that uh, decision-making process where you are advising the Board of County Commissioners. The sacrifice that's made is you have to be aware of and cognizant of your limitations on discussions you can have regarding environmental protection and uh, natural resource protections, things that are going to come back before you. So most of these are uh, issues that will be, well, some of these are issues that will be handled by staff. As I mentioned, reasonable notice, you don't have to worry about that. Staff is always going to make sure that these meetings are held in a place that is open to the public. Like I said, it has to be open both physically and psychologically. There were um, some cases where meetings were held in a prison and the uh, prison guards were requiring people to sign in and you know, give their name and information and address. And people didn't want to do that. And they said that's a psychological barrier to having a meeting. So yes, it was, it was open. The room was unlocked. You could go in, but um, you can't create 
a psychological barrier or a physical barrier to the public attending. The minutes taken and promptly reported. And the one that uh, that you really need to be on the lookout for as far as what you're, you're doing is that the public must have that reasonable opportunity to be heard. And that opportunity to be heard needs to happen in close proximity or as part of the decision-making process that they're commenting on. So um, this, this reference is starting to get a little dated, but I, I think back to the Plum Creek discussions years ago where the Board of County Commissioners had, I think it was four large workshops in different parts of the county where members of the public could come and sign up. And if you were able to speak at, at any one of those workshops, you were really, you were given that opportunity to provide public comment as part of the overarching uh, Plum Creek deliberation. So it might not have been at the meeting where the board made the final vote, but it was part of the overall decision-making process and it happened in reasonable proximity to the actual vote. So something to think about. I, I don't anticipate that uh, EPAC is going to get the same turnout as uh, the County Commission did for, for the Plum Creek discussions, but there are certainly items that are more interesting um, to members of the public that you might get a, a, a large turnout for. A couple of things that um, we do look for in the reasonable notice. We wanna know what board or what committee is meeting. There isn't really uh, a legal requirement for an agenda. We, as a county, we do typically encourage and practice having an agenda because it, it helps with the notice. It helps the public decide whether or not they wanna to go to the meeting. Is there anything they wanna to listen to or, or participate in? location and time of the meeting, reasonable manner, you know, how is it being uh, noticed? We, we notice, I believe, out on the front of our building. We notice on our website, we try to push out uh, Facebook posts saying, hey, come out to EPAC tonight or you know, whatever other committee it is. Um, reasonable time, both in the sense of giving people enough lead time to, to know the meeting is going to happen and also holding the meetings at a reasonable time. Um, open to the public, it's always going to be held in Alashua County. Uh, there's the physical or psychological barriers that we talked about. This one is something that's also important. You might be in the room, you might be having most of your discussions in a loud manner for the public to be able to hear, but occasionally you might get the urge to kind of lean back in your chair and, and turn to the person next to you and, and say something. And, um, you know, could be a joke, could be a comment that's completely unrelated, could be something that pertains to the meeting. And that is called the inaudible utterance rule. The idea there is just because you're in the room, just because you're speaking in a public meeting, if the public can't hear you, you're still... Violating is a harsh word, but you are still uh, not exactly working within the confines and intent of the Sunshine Law. So you don't want to be in a situation, both from the perspective of the public saying, you know, what are they talking about? Uh, and also just to stay in the good graces of the Sunshine Law, you don't want to be leaning back and having a side conversation or uh, really getting into the nitty gritty details without the public being able to hear. Um, these are open to the public. They're in public buildings. The public does have a right to record these meetings. This meeting is currently being recorded, which means that if a member of the public were to say, um, I'd like a, a copy of that recording, you know, we've created a public record. And there's no difference between a member of the public coming in. And as long as they're not being disruptive, as long as they're not uh, interrupting the, the flow of the meeting, they can record a meeting as well. The minutes must be written. They must be promptly recorded. Uh, as I mentioned, it you want to tackle the, the votes, the significant discussions. You can't have secret ballots where people are voting without somebody be, being able to say, you know, this person, um, you're not turning in a piece of paper that says yay or nay. The opportunity to be heard, as I mentioned, it's the reasonable proximity and time before the action actually occurs. Uh, you, as a committee, the board has rules of decorum 
they have roles for advisory boards. Effectively, or essentially, those rules are intended to ensure that meetings are, are flowing smoothly, that members of the public are not coming in and protesting or disrupting meeting, and so the county business can continue. And that includes how long public comment can go on, things of that nature. I don't. I know there's a. I know there's a heading on this one, but the uh, the share screen thing has conveniently blocked it. So I don't know if that says there it is. Social occasions, meetings. Uh, one thing I want to be clear about, and I mentioned this a little bit as far as what's reasonably foreseeable. You can still be social with all the members in this room. You don't have to, you know, dart across the street when you see David coming. You don't have to <laughs> avoid any uh, anybody else who's in this room. If you're friendly outside of these meetings, if you have you know, professional affiliations, things of that nature, that's perfectly fine. You can you can talk sports, you can talk weather, you can talk affordable housing. Well, weather weather's tricky on this one, but you can talk affordable housing. You can uh, you can talk any number of issues that are not reasonably foreseeable to come back before this committee. And that's that's the important thing, because I, I don't want everyone to think that, you know, for the duration of your time on on EPAC, that now you just have to, to give up professional associations or things like that that you were otherwise a part of because <laughs> somebody else is in. Um, retreats, that gets the idea of uh, where's a meeting happening? Are you, sometimes the Board of County Commissioners will go have a, a retreat meeting. It's still held in the sunshine. You're still getting minutes. I don't think EPAC necessarily does that. Most of your meetings, if I if I remember correctly, are, are in the same spot. Um, you're not typically taking field trips out to places, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so that's not particularly relevant to what you guys are dealing with. We sometimes so, uh, do. What was that? We sometimes do tours of, of sites, and I think that's probably in the same category. That would be, okay, so that, that's a good point. That would be part of the same category, and because this isn't a, a quasi-judicial board, you're not, you know, having these ex parte meetings, but when you go out to a, another site with members of this committee, you can do it one of two ways. One is you could go individually and try to orchestrate it so that no one's meeting with each other. Um, the other way is you could, if you were taking a tour of a site, you could either do it individually and come back to the, this meeting room or some other public meeting room and discuss what you all saw in an open public meeting. Or if you're going to have a meeting at that site, everybody could walk through the site, preferably not talk because it's going to be very hard to say that that's you know open to the public and then go to a room open the doors to the public have minutes being taken and have your discussions it's not something where you want to have a field trip where you know two members have, have veered off over here and you know three members are over here because we're not going to be able to get accurate minutes and the public can't follow both of those discussions. And, and I know that a lot of this is feels like it's in theory alone, because you know, let's face it, the, the public isn't uh, typically beating down the door to attend a lot of these meetings, and they might not be at those meetings anyway, but we have to make sure that we are um, preserving that opportunity for the public to come and follow along and participate. So Doing retreats is perfectly fine. Doing tours of sites would be perfectly fine. I, my recommendation would just be that as you do it, to either tour the sites individually or tour the sites as a group, ensuring that you know maybe everybody stays together with staff. Everybody understands that they shouldn't be having um, vocal discussions. And then you go and you have your meeting where you, you break down what you saw say hey you know when we were when we were over there 30 minutes ago this is what i was thinking this is okay, the part that, uh, that. Yeah. You, sorry there's more no i just wanted to park it on that discussion and make sure we're absolutely clear because we are planning a, a facility tour or something we've been talking yeah, about I'm, I'm pretty clear about what okay. we're doing okay. so you want to make sure that the whatever if you're going to have a tour 
And then a meeting, you wanna make sure that the facility that you're talking about is accessible to the public, uh, both you know, from an ADA perspective, as well as just, is there parking? Is it something that is in Alachua County and Alachua County residents can get to? Um, you don't wanna have a, you can't have a meeting in a place where someone would have to pay for admission into the building. So if, you know, if the county has a deal where EPAC members are getting to go in and tour the facility, but members of the public could not enter the facility, then you can't have a meeting, which means you can't have the discussion at that facility. You can tour it, you can um, stay largely silent and then come back to an open meeting and say, this is what we saw, this is what we think about it, this is what we wanna recommend that the Board of County Commissioners do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. This is the part that is never fun. Um, <laughs> if you knowingly violate the Sunshine Law, it is a second degree misdemeanor. And an individual can make a, a referral to the state attorney's office saying, hey, I saw two members <laughs> of EPAC. They were talking about uh, environmental protection issues. They were doing it outside of the Sunshine Law. Occasionally, it doesn't happen often. Occasionally, we do have members of the public who take it upon themselves to, to police these matters. And they do, you know, occasionally make referrals. The state attorney's office will then investigate them. I've never seen it progress past that. But it is important to know that this is, in fact, a, a criminal violation if the state attorney's office were to pursue it and anything were to come of it. Um, there's also non-criminal violations. Uh, which can be fines. Um, those are are on the individual level for the individuals who have violated the Sunshine Law. They're not something that the county would defend. They're not something that the county is involved in. That investigation would be on an individual level. Other things to keep in mind, if you have been, if it's discovered that you were discussing something reasonably foreseeable come before you, and then you voted on it, that action is vacated. So. From a practical perspective for the county, it can certainly slow down the process if someone were to say, hey, the, the deliberations, or at least in part, the deliberations happened outside of the sunshine, that action is now void. And we have to go back, we have to do it. We can't just you know, have another meeting and, and people vote the same way. You have to have substantive deliberations, substantive discussions to really cure that defect. Um, if you end up in a situation, there might be attorney's fees. As I mentioned, there might be fines. It's not, it's not fun. I try not to dwell on this part. I think everybody um, understands the, the limits that are placed under the sunshine, but I do want you to at least understand the, the potential consequences uh, moving forward. There are some exceptions to the sunshine law. I, I would say that this, as it says down there, um, these really don't apply to advisory boards. So. You know, you can look at them. It's collective bargaining. It's things like security planning. It's not something that's ever really going to come before EPAC or any other advisory board that I can think of. So we can just skip right past that. If you want, we can stop and talk about Sunshine Law some more, or we can go into voting conflicts, and then we can talk about, you know, do questions for everything at the end if you'd like. We can continue, yeah. I think. Okay. All right. Voting conflicts. There's a, a general obligation under Florida law that says if you are present in the room, you have to vote. Uh, one of the, as I mentioned, there's, you know, there are some sacrifices as far as uh, being on an advisory board. There's time. There's some of the, the outside discussions that maybe you can't have anymore. And another sacrifice is that sometimes there might be items that you really don't want to vote on. Maybe it's something that, you know, you don't, you, you don't feel comfortable with. But if you're in the room, you have to vote. There are some exceptions, though. So if there is a conflict of interest, you do not have to vote. But what you do have to do is you have to declare that that conflict exists. You have to fill out a certain form that we'll go over. And 
that is then incorporated into the minutes. So everyone will say, okay, well, so-and-so had a conflict on this particular item. They said uh, there was gonna be some sort of a, a harm or loss to a family member and therefore they, they abstained. So we'll get into what is a conflict. I, I will read this one a little bit. So if the vote, if the measure were to go to the officers. We have a question here. All right. Uh, and then let's say that you do have a conflict of interest. Uh, it, you're allowed to fully participate up to everything except voting. Is that correct? So, in other words, you have your opinion, uh, you know, fully partake in the meeting, but you just cannot or should not vote. There, there are some situations in which um, disclosing it. Let me see. I think I, I pulled up a. Uh, yeah, I pulled up a, an example over here. Let me see. Okay. There are some instances in which you can, you can continue the discussion. My advice would be that you don't my advice would be that if you have a con if you have a conflict that prohibits you from voting on a matter that there is a perception that as you continue to get into that dialogue that back and forth or potentially um, lobby for something that you wouldn't be able to otherwise vote for that it looks like you may have overstepped when you had a, a statutory voting conflict. So in some cases, you can disclose it, you can make it a part of the minutes, you fill out your form, and you can move move forward with the discussion. I do think that from a perception standpoint, it, it becomes a little bit uh, difficult to separate the idea of, of somebody continuing to advocate one way or another when they can't legally vote on that matter because of the, the voting conflict. Now, where I think there's a, an exception and probably some additional wiggle room is when you get into a matter of maybe there's gonna be a voting conflict and you know that you're gonna abstain, but also maybe you're kind of the expert in the room on something. Maybe really it's something that, that only, um, only you might have answers to in that, in that room. And so if, if people are saying, well, you know, what is this process like? Um, what, what's the business structure like? Things like that. Then it's probably reasonable for you as a person and as a, an EPAC member to answer those questions. You're not, you're not really advocating one way or another. You're just participating in the dialogue about the issue. I don't know if that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, thank you. I've got one. Okay. I'm in the grocery store and a citizen comes up to me and says, I just reviewed the minutes of the last meeting and boy, I really do not like the decision you guys made on X or Y. How do I engage that person without violating sunshine? Can I give him my rationale for voting the way I did, for example? Can I give him a flavor of the discussion in the room that wasn't reflected in the minutes? How, how do we handle that kind of thing? 100%. You can, that person in this scenario is not a member of EPAC. You can talk to them about anything you want. Um, you. You, can, you can say, hey, um, you know, minutes really only capture the general discussion. This was my perspective. This is how I interpreted these discussions. This is why I voted on something this way. Uh, that's perfectly fine. You're not running afoul of the Sunshine Law at all. Okay, thanks. No problem. So voting conflict, it's, it's very particular. It's when there is a special private gain or loss to you as an EPAC member, or if you know that there will be a special private gain or loss to... Uh, a principal by whom the officer is retained, parent organization of a corporate principal by whom they're retained. These, these are all the you know terminology in the statutes. Certain relatives, certain business associates. If if you work for a company and you know that hey, I'm gonna I'm about to recommend to the board of county commissioners that they hire this company, you know that that is going to have a private gain or loss to your company. 
to your principal in this situation. Um, other examples are if you're an attorney and you know that one of your clients is going to benefit or be harmed, then you're, you're creating a voting conflict uh, if you were to vote. Corbin? Yep. I, I, I have a question here. Um, what about something like um, the EPAC minutes? Let's say um, the person, uh, you know, an individual has, wasn't present for the, the previous meeting when the minutes were, you know, were taken and now we're voting on the minutes. Do, does that person still have to vote on those minutes? I mean, in, in non-governmental boards, I usually just recuse myself because I haven't had a chance to see the minutes yet. So that, that's not typically a, a substantive item that you know you would say if you're president, you have to vote. If you if you don't have any knowledge of it, I would say you could go one of two ways. You could either um, ask whether or not the you know other members in the in the room if this accurately reflects what happened and maybe have a kind of a secondary knowledge of it or because of the the nature of minutes and you not being there i would just say i'm not voting on this because i i wasn't there and i don't know if these minutes actually reflect the discussions that happened so that i would tend to go for that latter one excellent thank you So as I said, it has to be a, a special private gain or loss to you or certain individuals or, or companies. A private gain or loss has to be an economic benefit. It can't, it shouldn't be so speculative that you don't know whether it's going to happen or not. Um, special depends on the facts. You're looking at what is the class of individuals who are either going to benefit or be harmed. Kind of the, the silly example I guess I use is uh, the county commissioners vote on the millage every year it's either you know it's going to impact them but it impacts everybody so it's not a special harm or a special gain to them it everybody large class of beneficiaries probably not going to be special unless it's something like sure everybody in the county gets five dollars but this person gets a hundred dollars you're getting you're still getting a, a special benefit in that situation so they like i said those are kind of a, ridiculous examples, but you do get into some nuancy factual issues about, well, I'm, I'm going to benefit a little bit from this, but am I the only one benefiting from it? Am I benefiting enough for this to, to rise to the level of a voting conflict? Is it sure to happen? Or is it just something that I think if, if this does go forward, I might see an increase in my property values or something of that nature? Um, those are all the, the nuances that I was saying, give me a call. If you have questions, if something has popped up and you just want to say, Hey, what's, what's the status of this? Do you think this is a voting conflict or not? Corbin, can I ask you a real quick question? Yes. Um, and, uh, okay. So, so who decides when commissioners get a raise? Uh, that's a statutorily defined salary. Now, city commission is different, but I believe the okay. I believe the county commission is. I don't have the statute pulled up in front of me, but last time I checked, I think it's a statutorily defined calculation. Okay, and so where's the city fall? I mean, as far as the sunshine law and then deciding whether or not they get a raise, because that's like a benefit, a special benefit to them, right? So that's why I'm curious. It, it could be a special benefit to them um, in that situation. You know, as far as how the city, I'm thinking of the city of Gainesville in particular, how they operate, mm -hmm. I don't know whether or not there's something in their charter that um, creates a calculation or a, a process that was adopted in maybe a different alternate way. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm just not sure on that one. Okay, okay. I just was thinking, well, it's a, it's a state law, so everybody has to follow the law. Yeah, no, it's, it's actually a good question and, and something that out of curiosity's sake, even though I don't represent the city, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about, I just don't know the answer off the top of my head. All right, thank you. So th this gets into the, uh, when you know that the harm or loss is gonna be to a principal, what is a principal? It could be your employer, it could be a client that you have, um, or it could be some sort of a, a related 
corporation to your employer. Business associates, you're looking for, is this somebody who I routinely carry on a business enterprise with? Is this somebody who um, you know, I, is a business partner with me? That idea of a common commercial pursuit with the individual or entity, it doesn't extend so far as to be uh, ridiculous in the nature of if you're a landlord and a tenant comes up before you, that's not a business associate. That's not a, a even though, yes, there is some common commercial relationship, it's not the same. So really, you're looking for somebody who is kind of a partner, somebody who is some sort of a, an equal part of your commercial pursuit. So every statute very helpfully has a different definition of relative. And for the voting conflicts, relative includes this list. So if you know that a vote is going to have a harm or loss to your father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, sibling, or in-laws, then then that's a problem and you need to you need to abstain from that vote you need to disclose the conflict and you need to fill out form 8b which we'll talk about here in a second so you have a voting okay? <laughs> what was that but a cousin's okay because <laughs> under this statute there's there are other statutes where it's not but under this statute you're good <laughs> the, the florida legislature was very helpful in that um mm -hmm. if you have a voting conflict Obviously, you can't vote. You declare the conflict either at the beginning of the meeting if you know it, or as soon as it becomes apparent. If if you suddenly see somebody stand up and go, "Hey, um, the applicant is Corporation X Y Z," and you go, "Oh, well, I work for Corporation X Y Z. That's a problem. Didn't know about that." Uh, as soon as you know of the conflict, that's where you say, well, "You know, I want to pump the brakes. I want to disclose my conflict," and then staff will be able to get you the form eight B. Um, as I mentioned here, or as I mentioned earlier, you may participate. My advice is that from the perception that you don't participate in an advocacy way, that you're not advocating one way or another for something that you can't actually vote on. Now, there's obviously a fine line between what is advocating and what is just giving the facts especially you know each individual um, and, and how they perceive that but the more involved you get into these discussions i think the more the perception of what what is the purpose of your ongoing discussion on something that you can't vote on might cloud the the overall vote this is a general summary of what um this is what a form looks like. This is the form you'd have to fill out. You'd go into the minutes. You would identify who's going to have the, the special gain or loss, and then it would be retained in those minutes. Penalties could include removal from the advisory board, civil penalties, uh, restitution, public censure, and reprimand. You know, they're, they're not really... I try to give advice not just uh here's the black letter law and it says xyz but to say going forward this is how i i would act and the reason i do that is because you don't want to find yourself on the other side of these penalties same as as the others now, this one isn't a misdemeanor which is nice but still not something you want to you want to toy with this is a cartoon that somebody added to this like 15 years ago um and that concludes the <laughs> that concludes the overall presentation. Um, the one thing that I did want to add, and then we can get into questions, are public records. And I don't know. I don't know. If, the, uh, yes. Things, uh, I assume also that if if a person fails to disclose a conflict, and at some later time that conflict is discovered, then any any vote which was taken, in which that in which the, the violator uh, participated is also wiped off the books, right? No, it depends on... It doesn't have the same clear uh, void of an issue as sunshine issues, but you are going to call into question the vote and it's going to be 
a burden for everybody else in, in this room. So I certainly wouldn't do it and I wouldn't, I wouldn't test it. And the, the key right there is um, to, to try to, to at least be aware of what the red flags are that you should be looking out for to say, hey, um, I'm gonna call Corbin. I'm gonna see what's going on, whether or not this rises to the level of a voting conflict. So the, the, uh, the last quick topic I wanna get into, public records. Public records in Florida, you start from the premise that everything is a public record. The Florida Constitution, the Florida statutes, they're very broad in, in the public's access. And it's the same concept. It's, it's the idea of transparency in government, people being able to see how decisions are made. If you email staff about something involving county business, that's going to be a public record. If they email you, that's going to be a public record. If somebody else from the public emails you and it's about county business, it could potentially be a public record. You know, honestly, you'd want to get into the nuance, the, the nitty gritty of what was in the email, what was it about? Is this something in your personal life? Is this something that, that was really county business? But you do open yourself up to these questions of, well, you created a document or you received a document in the course of your county business, that is now a public record. What about if we-, we the send, we, Yeah, what if, what if we happen to contact you to, ahead of time to see, well, can I do this or not do this? Is that also included in the public record? If you contact me, yes. It, so if you, I mean, if you were to call me, you're not creating a record. If you were to send me an email, it, it might create, a, it would create a, you know, randomly just releasing emails. It really is just a matter of when, when members of the public, for whatever reason, we can't ask. When members of the public say, I'd like all the emails from this person on an exemption, under state law for why we can't give it to them, we have to give it to them. But you can always call me, you can always email me. Um, it, it creates a public record, but you know, public records aren't aren't the skill like to give the, the general advice that you be aware of what you are creating in a public record. Um, kind of the, the absurd example, someone were speaking and you were to say, this person's a real fool. <laughs> so, you know, like name them or something. You, you write it down on a piece of paper and then you hand it to staff or something. Um, that's a record. And if that person were to ever say, hey, I'd, I'd like, a, I'd like the, the notes that were kept at that meeting, we'd have to give it to them. So just be aware of, of what you are creating and be aware of what documents you are receiving so that you can retain them. That's really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, gee, thanks, Corbin. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm, I'm just the bearer of bad news in these presentations. It's just, let me tell you all the things you can't do and Summer can tell you all the great things you can do. <laughs> I see why you wanted to do this remotely. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> no one was taking me out for dinner after this, so you know, it's, it's, I'm not the fun one. Uh, so, does the state legislature and the governor have to abide by these things as well? They have their own laws, and right. yeah, um, so they they adopt the laws for the, that apply to the county. Some of them are, are not because they're, they're in the Constitution, but they adopt the laws that implement them. And, um, and then they have their own separate laws. Right. No, I did not know that. I thought oh, it applied wow, to yeah. everybody. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, we're about an hour into our meeting. So if we don't have. Oh. No, no, no. I, th I think you're right. We shouldn't be going. Okay. Thank you so much, Corbin. This is really helpful. I know we're joking about, you know, 
um, not taking you out to dinner afterwards, but this is, so, I think, really helpful for all of us. So and and you're escaping my, my bag of tomatoes here, so. Is somebody kicking you under the table? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I missed it. <laughs> Thank you, Corbin. No. All right, well, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to contact me or reach out to Summer, and Summer can put you through to me, and, and we'll go from there. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thanks. Just to conclude on that, my advice is if you have something you would like to provide other members for information, always send it to Summer. Yeah. Yeah. Someone will decide then how it is distributed. Yeah. Never email each other. That right there is a very easy way you violated the sunshine. So yeah. you, when you're communicating, everyone should always communicate themselves. Um, that's always your safe bet. It's, it's, a, it's a safest gather, thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. It may not be the only legal way, but, right. but it's the safest way. And it's the way we, gen we generally perceive all of our business. You made me a little nervous, though, then, saying that the, that the third party started to get worried about that. But as long as we're not saying, this person wanted me to tell you that. Right. It's so just, yeah. what yeah, we can't do that. typically do is gather all, all the information up, put it together, then provide it to you um, in one large form, usually in a meeting. By the way, if someone on the committee does send you an email, that's that for you, and actually for that person, is not a violation. It becomes a violation if you respond to that email. Yes. And it's the same thing. The reason why, by the way, you'll notice if you send an email to uh, to Summer, which is meant for the all EPAC members, she'll publish it and you know, everyone here will get a chance to read it. But if we respond to it to her, she won't send that back to the person who, or to anyone else on, on the committee. That's to protect that part of the sunshine. Anybody else have anything on that I, I mean, you know, comments on it? I, Corbin did a great job on this. So. Okay. Now I see why we had to have that with all the new members that may or may not know about it. I just want everyone to know what you're getting into. Uh, I don't think it will, you know, cause a problem for most of us here. <laughs> Jay and I happen to be on another environmental com committee together. And uh, I have some questions which I submitted earlier in the day to Corbin privately to say, okay, how do we deal with this? Because believe me, that committee, is, which is the uh, uh, NAACP Environmental and Climate um, Justice Committee, we're going to be talking about some environmental things that we may also be talking about here. Now, the course of action we take are different, but believe me, it doesn't mean that we aren't going to be meeting in that committee as well. But it does mean that, you know, I'm going to have to really get a clear, and Jay too, get a really clear idea of what we can and cannot do and Absolutely. where we got to draw the line, where we need to, you know, not, not be participating in, in an ECJC meeting you know, and where we if, we, if we do something that at some point in time occurs in in here, okay, realize the thing he said was if it's a foreseeable thing. Well, there's a lot of things that we don't, that come to us, which we do, and they're not really for actions. Remember that, that word action was also applied in that sentence. It's not just that it comes before us, but it comes before us for a foreseeable action, okay? So, if, you know, if someone has something, you know, that, that um, will never actually come before you know us for foreseeable action. That's not going to be, or doesn't ever come from us for us. Then that's not a violation. But if it's foreseeable that a, a topic yeah. could come in front of us, then you know we have to understand that can be a violation for us. Um, now, if we did it and it was unforeseeable, it's not going to be you know a violation. The trick is, you know, in a U.S. law violation. It's only going to be a violation if, you know, if, if you say, you know, in this case, I don't, or unless in your writing, you know, however they discovered it, they can demonstrate that you did it consciously or intentionally. Because that means it was, or you foresee, you knew foreseeably. Intentionally makes it, raises it to a whole other level, by the way, as, as you would expect it to. So um, if you're trying not to and you accidentally violate something, you know, it's going to be a lot less than if you are intentionally violating it for some, you know, arcane reason. Okay. So those are just some things I wanted to add to it because those are the finities that we may run into here. If you run into someone else at a meeting, I heard it in the past said, well, just don't sit with that person. And what Carbon really said was, you know, be careful about saying things under your breath. 
Yeah, I go to meetings all the time and sit next to the person who's from here and talk about something other than, you know, maybe it was something, you know, that was that was done, um, you know, that had to do with, you know, something that's never, ever possibly going to come to us. This is not an environmental issue. Well, I'm not going to worry about that. But if we were sitting in the, in the meeting and the, the board was discussing, um, you know, um, whether, you know, it should be called a slaughterhouse or or, or whatever, it was, what's the other meat name they had for that? Uh, meat processing. Meat processing, meat processing facility. facility. Then yeah, that's something that can come before this committee and we shouldn't have been discussing that. So it, it, it's really best, and, you know, if you really aren't in, in good control of what you're saying at all times, not to sit with that person, okay? Mm -hmm. Or to make sure that you only discuss other subjects and over time you'll, you'll develop a good feeling for that, what that is. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great suggestion to not actually discuss it or eat that number. But I'll be honest, we've had a husband and wife team on this on this committee. And, um, you know, you, I've had friends, people who I've known for a long time who have on this committee. And, you know, you can meet and talk, but you just have to stay, stay away from things, you know, they're going to come here. So that's, that's the bottom line. Um, next item here is air quantity monitor update was with Chris. I guess he's moved in a position. He's Saying, okay, it's my turn, my turn. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Should we Absolutely. let the people online know that we can't see them if they put their hand up? Sure. You know, actually, we could switch you. Only if they're a member of this committee Zoom, that you can't that. communicate with them. No, you, you can, have, you can, see, you can switch it there. to Zoom. I think yeah. you can do it through the view. Sorry. Yeah, yeah there's Here, a view screen. function where they can. Yeah, share. The, uh, share a screen. There it, is. it is shared screen, right? Yes, yeah. it is shared screen it. over uh, Edge. Yeah, because it's a little clunky because we're not with the app. We're with. So how do you? But we did show slides. sharing, so it show it says yeah, that we're we sharing. sharing. Oh, but then he can't see the slide. Yeah. Right. right. I think if we were in the actual app, it might be different. But thank you. That's a that's a great idea. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just interrupt us. Yeah, so. that's a good point. So, um, do you want to? Uh, who who? It's, it's just it's Mark and. Uh, Jeff. Yeah, if y'all have a question, just holler because we won't be able to see you if you use the raise your hand function. Um, Absolutely. And again, uh, yeah, you can definitely same thing for, for everybody here. And if you have a question, that uh, by all means, feel free to uh, uh, interject in that. Uh, so there's a lot of information uh, between the two presentations and that. And of course, if something comes afterwards, we will provide you with copies of, of what I'm presenting here today. So again, you can review it over. And if a question comes later up, you can either uh, inquire with myself or, or go through summer and and ask any questions on that because again we're, we're covering a large spectrum of information in, in a short period of time and thoughts may come to you well after you're you're back home and you go wait a minute uh, what about what about this so uh, by the way this, not being able to see a presentation is a good reason to come here for the <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to come on out and uh, appreciate the questions that you do have that you've uh, you've asked Summer on that, and I'm uh, going to give you a, a quick synopsis of uh, our actual program that we uh, previously had. Uh, back in uh, 1999, uh, the board had uh, asked the department to uh, create an air section uh, within the department, and of course their concerns at that point in time was due to industries that were building up in the county and, and potentially affecting the citizens within. And of course, uh, uh, we uh, ended up with a, a monitoring system, which uh, you can see here uh, and that and it's moved around in the county and we'll, we'll talk about that in the slide, but uh, it ran through till March of 2003. And again, the whole idea was to develop a community-based air program and also have uh, the state's Department of Environmental Protection approval and delegated local authority to approve air permits, uh, development and review, uh, as well as handle internally uh, all of our issues. Uh, and that respond to complaints, which we continue to do to this to this day. We work hand in hand with the DEP and the EPA on all air issues that are within the county. Uh, again, development review for impacts of proposed infrastructure that's coming in there. Believe it or not, after the pandemic, there's a lot of new development that has started up. So we monitor between the different sections and that uh, the applicants as they come through for all of the environmental concerns that may come. Uh, education, again, continued education. Uh, uh, again, we go out and we do speak to different associations, different community uh, uh, businesses and organizations with uh, any requests that they do have. I, I do a lot with the hazardous materials section 
and that uh, going out to local businesses as well as to uh, realtors, going out to um, the, the Lawyers Association and educating all of the different uh, infrastructure out there and people to what are the rules and regulations within a lateral county. Because they do vary from uh, county to county and that we are a more stringent county, so we do supersede the federal and state requirements. You can't take away from a law, but you can add to a law and make it more stringent. Uh, compliance and enforcement. Uh, all of our air complaints since uh, 2003 uh, are funneled through the hazardous materials section. Uh, we do assign uh, one of the uh, inspectors slash officers to go out and investigate. Uh, and we have handled every uh, single uh, complaint that has come in through the department successfully uh, since the air program did phase out. Any idea how many complaints <laughs> that is? I would have to actually do a search through the SharePoint database, but uh, air, believe it or not, it, it's sort of like all the other ones, they come and go. Uh, I would say uh, air on an average in that, we we, we probably have about uh, a dozen to, to maybe 20 in a year that come in. A year? Yes, sir. Hmm. Now, some of them are everything from, again, a uh, person burning something in their backyard that is emitting a, uh, a smoke and an odor issue uh, to all the way to, uh, I guess it might even be a little bit bigger than that. I have to like say, you know, verify, but we have dust complaints too. And that has impact on local community. We had one uh, over with the uh, concrete uh, batch plant in the Porter's neighborhood. And again, it, it, it took us a while to, to work with them to find a solution to the problem. But uh, again, we successfully completed that and have had no other uh, complaints from the neighborhood. Um, can you kind of briefly tell us what other kinds of complaints that you take in? To we, we take in everything from erosion of sedimentation uh, complaints, hazardous materials complaints, uh, water, wastewater complaints. You know, somebody's pouring something, something's gotten into the creek. Uh, people are illegally mm -hmm. dumping. We do sinkhole complaints, which are, are concerned because they're direct conduits back to our, our aquifer and our drinking water. Uh, we also do uh, well, natural resources, wetlands, uh, eco-sensitive areas that do come in. And that somebody's gone into a wetland and they've expanded where they shouldn't. Or again, they went and they cut all the trees down. So again, there's a lot of different moving uh, complaints that do come through the department. Uh, I do uh, assign a lot of those now as sort of a, a central clearinghouse where uh, there's always one set of eyes always looking at the complaints that come into the department on a on a given day. And again, we get everything, including meth labs and everything else. Uh, we also support all the other agencies, law enforcement, fire rescue, the hazardous materials team, to incidents that happen in the county. If we if we notice something, should we, is there another channel we should be going through or should we come directly? You to can you can call in on the, uh, the generic number in that and they'll get directed, either input themselves if I'm not available or one of the managers or uh, one of the uh, staff. Number, is it number for EPD? The, uh, yeah, the 264-6800 number. Okay, yeah. Or you can even email, same thing. If you email in to either myself, to Summer, uh, we're more than happy to, again, uh, put it in. And it's, it's again, a complaint. It's like anything else. It's a public record. And uh, under Bill 60, which Florida statutes of, uh, have passed, <laughs> there's no such thing as anonymous complaint anymore. If there's no name and phone number, no name or address associated with it, we're not allowed to investigate it. I'll, I'll clarify that a yes, little sir. bit. If it's at, at um, excessive risk of life safety yes. or, or um, the environment. Imminent. So if it's an imminent threat, you can be anonymous. Yes. There is an exception. There's, for there's that. an exception. But in general, like, hey, my my neighbor, my neighbor's this business, you know, knocking down their wall. Yeah. You know that you can't be anonymous kind of to you are. But, but if, if, if it's an absolute threat, like you're seeing something, you dump, yeah. you know, hazardous waste into the creek, you know, Correct. you can or into a well, you can be anonymous. In that yes. The creek turned blue. Then that's an anonymous. Absolutely. Yeah. There's certain ones that will, uh, and that, or if it's tied to something that's potentially a criminal issue, then you are protected under that imminent threat. And that is the exception. Same thing with emergency response calls that we get. People sometimes do react as it comes down from national to state to us. And that is acceptable under those. But typically, uh, the thing that they've re brought that reason out there for is that you have the right to uh, address the person that's made the complaint against you. You have the right to challenge that. And that's where it comes. And if you do send it as a text or an email, 
it's automatically a public record. So again, a phone call is the easiest way to you know, send something in if you don't want to be tracked. And then of course, uh, permitting capability in that for, for uh, facilities that do require air permits. This is your uh, concrete batch plants. This is anybody with an incinerator and that that is required to meet uh, state and federal air quality emission standards. And that was one of the things. And of course, the, uh, the one that was the big one back in the early 2000s and it's continuing on and it's changed its name from greenhouse gas to again, climate change and resilience and sustainability uh, is the reduction of which was part of the program. We actually had, uh, if you've been here long enough, we had the rapid vehicles that said, hey, come talk, I'm a hybrid. And so it was the, the first of the gas versus electric hybrids. And uh, uh, I know that the city has a couple of totally electric vehicles that are that are wrapped. Uh, and that to say, you know, here we are, we're, we're not using you know, uh, uh, anything that's generating greenhouse gases and that it's not using petroleum product. Uh, and that, to, and, and again, uh, you still see that changing as we move forward with new technology. Isn't that just not exactly true? Since when you plug your vehicle in, it's going to a coal generated electrical system. There's idiosyncrasies to it. And yes. then yeah, that you're not totally removed from, yes, it's not coming from wind. It's not coming from total solar. So again, but the vehicle itself, true, true to the nature and that, once it's assembled and it's in use in that, it is a cleaner energy. Again, if it's coming from natural gas, it's cleaner than coal. If it's coming from solar, it's cleaner than any of the others. Yeah, true, uh, and I don't mean to argue this with you mm -hmm. at all, but I just, uh, the reason, one of the reasons I want to be on this committee is that that's true, except for when the batteries do die, they have to be disposed of. Correct. And then there's a whole nother element of pollution Correct. you have to deal with. And actually there, uh, uh, I'm on a number of international uh, committees and one of them that they're they're trying to address right now is end of life for for uh, the rechargeable battery industry. Uh, just like you're hearing a lot of stuff coming out of California and New York, where they're talking about end of life time back to the manufacturer, so they have a responsibility at the end of its life, so it just doesn't go into a landfill. Uh, they're looking at a lot of recycling capabilities, especially with lithium, due to the fact that it is such a hard material to find and to excavate from the mines. And you get so little amount for the amount of tonnage that you have to excavate to get it. So uh, they are looking at that process to close that loop and again make it more of a a recyclable, you know, re uh, reusable same product. With, same with cadmium too. Same thing what, with cadmium. Yes, sir. What was the the term you used? Concrete batch. Is that right? ba batch plant. That's a processing plant where they where they they manufacture the uh, concrete. So it's a, it's a, if, is it the first time around, or is that you know where they're you know, reprocessing or no, know. that's where they would actually mix the uh, okay. the uh, the gravel with 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 the cement to to form the okay, concrete. So As time. compared to a manufacturing plant like in uh, Argos out in Newberry, where they actually mine the material, which will then become part of the 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 concrete with the okay. with the fly ash and everything, and it's shipped off to the batch plants. What what about the the facilities that we have in this county, which are reprocessing um, C and D? You know, and and you know, they're taking and recycle recycling the, the concrete, right? And what do they do with they break that back into a? Uh, uh, again, there's a, a lot of uses in that. A lot of it is crushed and then reused as a as a uh, a finer material. And that uh, we have one just short distance away here that uh, that that does that with a lot of a lot of concrete that would normally be directed towards a C and D is being recycled and reclaimed and they got different options that they do with it. Some of it can go back just into more uh, mm -hmm. into uh, uh, riprap material and that. So you got mm -hmm. larger material, it's crushed down, it's uh, driveway fines. Uh, some of it's being used for base roads. Uh, so there's a lot of different uh, options available to recycling the concrete, is which that normally we go Is that a pretty clean operation or is there, uh, because, because I know I was, I was recently reading the, the health problems that are coming from the you know, that came from the workers from the 9 11. You know. Right. And, you and know, there was a lot of chemicals I can definitely yeah, tell that, you. There that. were a lot of other things in burning, you know, yeah. for the first. But, you know, they said even after that, all that initial phase went down, right. there was, you know, so much, you know, of that dust in the air still for people for a long And a lot of that was asbestos, mercury from computer monitors, and a lot right. of the heavier, uh, more uh, carcinogenic products. Now, concrete. Crushing does generate dust, and that's one of the things that we, we do monitor 
and that and again it is adjacent to a batch plant in the neighborhood and and again amazingly enough uh zero complaints coming from the the concrete crusher because they're using uh, a water spray to yeah. minimize that potential just as you go to the batch plants you'll notice they get the sprinklers going that's to keep the dust from starting sure. in the first sure. place and it's, the particles. exactly yeah. and, mo and actually our dust complaint that was coming from there wasn't from any of the manufacturing processes or the recycling processes it was actually coming from the material as they come in from the trucks to dump the sand that they used to make it yeah. and then the trucks were driving back through it and dragging it out onto the street uh -huh. and then traffic was causing it to raise up yeah. and this is going to be more and more you know an issue in this county because we're you know adopting zero waste both for the Absolutely. county and the city yeah. and recycling is definitely a a, a a wonderful thing that we push for too and that because again if you're if you're uh, recycling it reusing it it's not going to a end of life location yeah. and that's part and parcel what we're we're here for definitely so a quick question maybe yes, we don't know this one but i mean my understanding the concrete plants have the washout and they just have a big pile of washout and then they have to dispose of that washout wouldn't it be more efficient for them to take it to the reprocessing plant and just have them crush it into well maybe I mean, they enough, could resell it right the washout yeah. rack is to solidify it so that they end up doing something with it because while it's in a sort of semi-state you can't have it solidify in the trucks because right. it's going to cost you and stop the operation but again those are well controlled and again it's basically just a uh, a lined uh, pit area where they have a slope so that they can dump whatever's remaining in it. Right. And depending on the operation with what they do with it, some of them will again have it crushed up. Some will treat it as a solid waste. Mm -hmm. And that, and again, it just depends on the facility. Most of the the uh, forward-thinking facilities are looking at again because again, if you throw it away, it's costing you money for right. every pound that you throw it away. So it, it's more of a financial change to do it. But again, they're also thinking of uh, of again, you know, the the global. Uh, environmental impact yeah and so you see a lot more of them that are okay once it's solidified you come in dig it out and then you crush it yeah okay absolutely i know that florida concrete down the street they're right next to the batch plant yes they share a fence line for the washout they recycle it as soon as it's dry. yeah they open up as soon as it's dry and they can lift it up and they take it back in absolutely so as soon as it's dry they're recycling it right now. so it makes Good. a lot of like, yeah yeah it makes a great sense and it's a great opportunity it absolutely uh, some more history on that. Uh, obviously, we had our air monitoring site in accordance with the, the federal EPA and the DEP uh, procedures, and we had uh, SOPs that were developed, and the uh, DEP data recording software systems were implemented. And again, tied to all our equipment. There's a lot of electronics inside the trailer that come with those uh, monitoring units. Uh, and again, the site uh, collected legally defensible data for fine particulates, which is our uh, 2.5, and, and of course, ozone. And again, we did pass the audit. All systems and data were accepted by the DEP for everything that we did collect for Alachua County. Uh, the big thing you'll see, though, is as we progressed in with, with our units and that, for start, we started with one individual, then we added staff, vehicles, equipment, and maintenance. And you see the cost keep, kept creeping up. And in, in year 2002, uh, 2003, which uh, would have been fiscal year 2002 to us, uh, that was when the, the commission decided to uh, shut down the program, just due to the fact that, again, with budget restraints and everything happening, uh, you know, that's a lot of money that they can go on somewhere Wasn't else. Wasn't that really the state that, uh, you know, it, that was when they passed the cement, the, the ordinance to protect the cement plant? No, sir. That, no. that was a commission. That was, that was a commission right. decision based on budgetary issues. Oh, and, yeah. and that, because, again, you know, it, you know, like anything, it, you, you, you can grow if it's a good period of time, but you shrink if it's a, if it's a tighter period of time. And again, you know, uh, almost $600,000 when you decide maintaining police, fire, roads, uh, and everything else, uh, that's a hard sell to, to, to maintain on something that technically the state is also doing. So you're, you're basically duplicating uh, services. And that was the thought at the time was, you know, you're basically duplicating a service. And, that, and then of course we had a lot of monitoring sites and this is the one that you see here was actually out at uh, the Jonesville Park. It's now a big development with uh, soccer fields. Uh, and it used to be UF property, amazingly enough, at the time. As you can see, UF, they were out at the airport. They were out in Jonesville at uh, ESC uh, Environmental. And again, they did a little small period up at uh, uh, Hale Plantation. And again, they monitored for ozone and particulate matter 2.5 and 10. 
Has there been any, any monitoring since then or none at all? Not for Alachua County, no, okay. sir. The state obviously does the, ma the majority of the, uh, the monitoring across the entire the entire state, again, you know, actually it's not even, it's more than 19 million citizens. We're growing by 1,200 people a day uh, with the influx coming from up north California uh, and that. But again, uh, they, they do operate monitoring networks in 26 counties with assistance from eight delegated uh, county programs, which are, are listed here from Broward, Duval, Hillsborough, Palm Beach. They're large, large counties. The smallest county that I saw was half a million population. And we are half of that, uh, you know, and then some because of the fact that we're also counting a lot of students that are in influx too. Uh, and that's so I think we're broaching right around 202,000. Right, about 280,000 now. Okay, 280,000 now. Chris, I got a question about the monitors. Yes, sir. How many uh, monitors do, did the county have back then? Uh, where, and where were they approximately located? They were all located out in Jonesville at the very end for that last final year and a bit. Uh, and again, next to the trailer, as you saw there. Uh, let's go back. Yeah. So they were out there primarily because? Uh, down at the bottom, and that's, that was because of the concrete batch plant that was in Newberry. Can you talk about the, the cement plant? The cement plant. Or sorry, the cement plant, the actual manufacturing okay. gypsum cement plant. Because, um, and now today we have just one or two uh, along uh, 441 or I-75. I-75, correct. The thing that I object to about having just one fixed at that location, it underestimates the exposure of people within the city. If you're a driver or a pedestrian at 34th and, uh, and uh, Newberry Road or 34th and Archer Road, you're getting a whopping exposure. And I've I've held campaign signs for political things, and so at the end of the day, I felt like I've just been exposed to incredible amounts of stuff. But um, and then those living in the, in the, the country are getting an over representation of what they're really being exposed right, to. Right. Right. And so I think that it's kind of meaningless to have, to make a broad average, mm -hmm. and it's the people who are in. Uh, High traffic areas where there are a lot of uh, cars, trucks, and buses um, that really, you know, we're, we're under protecting citizens who are exposed to that on a daily basis. School settings, I, I mentioned that in the, in when I made that, that ultra fine particle uh, adverse health effects. The EPA has a, do, has a white paper or a policy paper on um, how schools should be cited, where they should be placed to mm -hmm. avoid exposure, and that parents should not be allowed to park their running cars in front of entrances so that five days a week, twice a day, their kids are being exposed to car exhaust. Mm -hmm. So the EPA has specific recommendations. Right. Oh, these things don't seem to be conserved. Um, at least the school setting. Right. Well, I think the big the big thing that ultimately comes down to is you're right. You know, it's based on where they go, but uh, because a lot of these systems aren't uh, easily portable and move around. That's why I thought portable monitors right. would free us up to do all sorts of investigations. Investigation, definitely. And I do have a slide for you on on that to to conversate about it. And do you have any monitoring locations in Alachua County? We, we have one. One. Okay. One. Yes, sir. So again, uh, I, we're, we're looking at the primary monitoring of the ambient air for the federal designated critical air pollutants. And so you have your ozone, your sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, lead, nitrogen dioxide in particular. And lead, uh, obviously with unleaded fuel on that, that has gone way down uh, and that and and of course now it's the uh, the nitrogen and the sulfur dioxides, which are again the vehicle exhaust that you, that you talk about. That would be the big thing with with uh, interacting with vehicles. And again, that's going to start changing. Uh, funny enough, the the amount of electric vehicles that they say on the road are starting to influence things such as even our gasoline tax, because they're not collecting anything for them running up and down the road. What I was reading a couple of days ago, it isn't so much the exhaust, the tailpipe exhaust, tailpipe exhaust, it's tires and brakes. 
the um the the brakes definitely are still an issue because one of the, the things metal, all the little metal part of it. not so much metal uh believe it or not your brake pads and that uh the metal will come from the rotors but the brake pads still have asbestos in them it's one of the few things out there that is exempt that you're allowed to still have in manufacturing even though if asbestos was in this room we wouldn't be allowed to be in here and so that's part of it too is again particulate matter with a with a you know carcinogen subject but it's not really going to matter is it? when they start putting the fossil gypsum on the in building in the highways and then that can be in the runoff too so, I mean, you know. <laughs> so yeah i mean you know obviously they focus in on the, the major the major issues concerns that, that come along and the constantly science is, is looking at the things as you know, a check and balance but these are the most the most common since they are the critical air uh, pollutants that you have uh, particulate again, uh, for especially for uh, the individuals that are not familiar with the uh, air issues, and that the uh, PM 2.5 is again your small particulates of concern that are extremely small found in smoke, haze, and again, you heard about Chicago, you heard about New York with the Canadian wildfires, and it was a big concern because you, you look up and it was just a, 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 a foggy reddish smoke. And that, that that had come into the community and it was causing a lot of respiratory problems, especially with anybody with any type of respiratory issue. And that uh, the the young, the old, anybody with COPD, uh, so you have an obstructed pulmonary disease, then uh, it's definitely going to trigger. And again, they're extremely small. You're talking 2.5 micrometers in diameter, extremely small. This is stuff that is definitely going to get down into your airway. Uh, as compared to our PM10, which is a, a 10 micrometer diameter or uh, the equivalent of one seventh of a diameter of a human hair. So again, it's still going to get down in, but the larger particles, our body expels back up with, with coughing, with phlegm to uh, you know, remove it from the body. And then depending on what the nature of that particle is to how much mm -hmm. harm it can potentially do to a person. Asbestos is a good example. It's like a, if you look at it under magnifying glass, it's like a porcupine quill. And once it gets in, it stays in and it won't, it, we can't come back out. So the only option is the body encapsulates that. And of course, when it encapsulates it, that area can't be used for the oxygen gas exchange anymore. And if you get enough of them, you end up with a spot on your lung, no different than if you smoke and you end up with lung cancer, or if you're a coal miner and you got black lung. These uh, show some of the examples of the data that we, uh, we uh, have collected in that. Uh, and again, you notice that the uh, Alachua County monitoring, the 2.5 in the ozone, uh, was found to be consistently lower than the, the uh, federal standard. And that, but again, that is in a specific spot that it was monitored and that it may be that it had better air where, than where on 34. Location? Sorry, sorry. And where is that location? That location was out at Jonesville back in back in uh, 2003. Oh, yeah. yeah, so it gives you an idea of what we were monitoring at the time when it, and again, this is all in, in uh, parts per billion and again in the 2.5. So in the last 20 years, you guys haven't generated data like these? No, the state did generate all the data from that but point But they forward. don't generate much of the data in Alachua County, is that right? They generate all the information based on their one location. And then one location again. I'm sorry. Painsbury. Painsbury. Yes, sir. Where is it? Sorry, I knew that. It's, it's down. It's down on the flat Paints Prairie. We're next to you know uh, over by the uh, interstate in 441. So it is going to take a higher hit of traffic because it is a as you know the interstate is extremely busy, and, and that. But again, uh, for ourselves, no. Well, we we don't have an air program. It was it was ceased in 2003. So the only data we get is when we go out to something as a complaint measure. Uh, we do have some great measurements of things. Uh, matter of fact, we had a ozone release that uh, the feds caught and they thought it was in Alachua County for uh, about three days and that until we told them there's no manufacturing in that area where, where they caught it from the satellite and it turned out it was in an adjacent county. Is state monitoring staying about the same? Been budgets cut, raised, or where's that at? Budgets haven't changed for, well, the, the certain portions of the state's budget have been impacted over the years. You know, they've gone down, they're coming back again. For the data, I would have to actually reach out to the state yeah. and, and do a data request from them. Okay. And that, but I do interact, like I say, with uh, the DP quite often. I'm actually working on an air complaint with them right now. So uh, I will reach out to them and see what information that I can extrapolate and, and pass on. 
uh, to the group. Yes, sir. I might be Robin from an upcoming slide, but uh, is the uh, are you guys happy with the state data? Uh, do you have any plans to look for what might be cheaper alternatives and the restarting of a program in Alaska County? Uh, we are going to get to that in a, in a slide too. Definitely, Sorry. definitely not a problem. The one thing I will uh, uh, mention in that, and uh, uh, Steve was actually at the, the conference not too long ago, and one of the, the, the keynotes uh, did mention that, believe it or not, the state of Florida has what is one of the better states in the entire 50 states for air quality, just because of the fact that we are surrounded by coastal and we do get a lot of wind and that does help as compared to the in the, the you know interior states that don't have that uh, that same ability and that from from nature, uh, and that so it is a good thing they did you know reinforce that Florida does have a very good air quality, uh, and that and that that's impressive to hear and that is based on true data that uh, they capture from the feds in the state. But that's that's just measurements out in Jonesville, for instance the the. the well, again, in Florida, they have, you know, again, the total, uh, they're going to cover the entire state. But there are pockets that individuals in the daily lives are exposed to True. that are far higher. True. Which don't, I, you know, how you go about, how anyone goes about um, quantifying, right. making meaningful data out of, okay, that in the city of uh, Gainesville, uh, 10 areas, they're hot spots. Hot right. Spots. How do you cope with these people who are being hyper exposed to things uh, that 100, 200, 500 yards away they're not? Right. Um, and I think it's, you know, the unfortunate thing with that is it is a, you know, it's not perfect in, in, in the real world, you know, perfection. Everybody would know where they are and what they're doing. That's why, you know, even with OSHA, we have regulations on what you're allowed to be exposed to and, and with certain chemicals. And that, and again, it's not a perfect world because, you know, you may, go to work and be under that allowable threshold for eight hours, I may go way over without realizing it. Again, how do you, how do you balance that? That's the hard part. And it, it is, it's not a perfect, it's not a perfect system, but again, based on uh, where we were, you know, 50 years ago, we've come a long way to, you know, what we didn't know. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And again, it can get better. It definitely can get better. Uh, portable equipment. Uh, obviously, there's, there, you know, they do have their benefits and they do have their, their, their pluses and minuses. So one nice thing is, yeah, portable. You can take it with you wherever you go, uh, and that, and it's easy to deploy. Some of the things that come with it, though, is the fact of uh, the cost. You know, if you only have one, you know, so that becomes a problem. You only have one, so it's only going to that one location that the person's taking it. Uh, I believe they start around thirty-five hundred dollars. I, I got a whole bunch of. Uh, emails from Airqual yes, and from a from a distributor of Airqual, and um, the unit starts at three thousand. But then, as a matter of fact, I had some of it here. Um, the particulate monitor is eleven to twelve hundred dollars. But then there are separate sensors for SO2, four hundred dollars. Carbon monoxide, four hundred. Right. Carbon dioxide, six hundred. And um, the so that then there are operational costs right. and a maintenance of yeah. calibration requirement. Correct. But that's only about two hundred dollars. And right. if you're talking about a five hundred thousand dollar expense two thousand three, I'm not <laughs> sure what whether you run the numbers, but you can get I can get I can send you uh, at least some stuff that you perhaps didn't see. Right. No, no, definitely. Uh, you know, the one thing with it is that uh, obviously uh, very familiar with the handhelds and that coming from the fire rescue industry where every single one of the four gas units, you're talking $3,500 a pop. Plus the fact that, again, they got to be calibrated before and after each use to even qualify them as acceptable for the readings. Uh, the person has to be trained to be able to calibrate and use it. Uh, but then that's where it comes in is, you know, training the staff is not a big deal, but the staff themselves. Uh, that would mean another body. Uh, so salary plus a vehicle, we're talking $150,000 before we even touch the, the unit. Uh, it's, it's one of the downfalls with it. Because again, uh, you know, I have three staff and then they're already, you know, we're over max with what we do on a daily basis, just keeping up with, with complaints, inspections, emergency response in the county. If we added this to it, 
again, you know, my my first ask would be probably about uh, one hundred seventy five thousand dollars just to start with one unit. So the the prairie, the Thames Prairie sensor is the state EPD sensor. The D Department of Environmental Protection. So yes, you so you you right now you have no money put input or there's no expense for any air quality program. No, so, sir. Okay. No, sir. And of course, fiscal year 24 is almost finalized because they got to approve it and it's got to be blessed before October 1st under Florida statute. You can't have an unbalanced budget. So again, you know, uh, to even ask for this would have to go into fiscal year 25 as they start. And because of that kind of ask, it would have to come out of general fund. And that's so it's taking if I ask for one hundred seventy five thousand dollars, I'm taking away from some other department potholes and all the rest of that and then you know it's not a bad idea if we could if we could get the funding for it for sure but again uh the big thing is that we don't have any outstanding complaints that have not been solved or resolved in the last 20 years since the year program went away we work hand in hand with the state as well as with the federal epa on all of these complaints they all get uh investigated and resolved and that so that is a plus on our side Except for, you know, again, if there was something specific. Yeah, well, the the average citizen can't see a particle. It's just 2.5 no, particles. No, so, you can. know, they what can. are they complaining about? You know, I, I felt something. You know. No, but we do get we do get calls about uh, breathing difficulties or if they think that there's a smell of an odor. We do handle a lot of those each year when they do come in. Mm -hmm. And that, and again, just like when somebody's burning something and they pick up on either the smoke's come and bothered me or the smell. Okay. And so we do trigger on all of those, too, because... <laughs> Well, for everyone, for everyone's, it, this is one of the main main points you know, that I wanted everyone to hear to, in this meeting from Chris today, right. because you know over the next month, in a couple of months, we're going to be looking at this you know in in greater depth, you know to try and see is this something we really need to be doing? Is something that's practical? What's the you know what's the the financial logic behind it? What's the right. protective logic for you know? And I want to give you the information so as a as a uh, committee, you guys can actually discuss it. And again, if a recommendation comes out that that hits to the commission saying something, then, then, you know, that is what it is. I'm just giving you the picture of what we do today. And, and again, if you, if you do recommend, this is the ask that comes with it. It's not small. It's going to be a, it's going to be a big ask when you send it. Is, is there any sense, any, yeah, any sense or data on whether air quality since 2003, since whenever, you know, I to account you is declining thing. There's been no, there's been no uh, alerts, no notices, no emails, no phone calls from the state or the federal government for what, EPA. What about this, this collection? I mean, I guess it's one collection point. Is, right. that, is there anything about the data it collects that would give a general statement about the air quality for that location? Right. It, it would be, on? it would be a trigger some thing such as, again, like you see in New York, where all of a sudden you were getting the alerts saying the air quality is considered bad due to the smoke and and it's causing a potential health threat you know right people uh, stay inside specific events, but I yeah. mean, over time again years in, in that time we have again had nothing that has been drawn to our attention that i'm yeah, aware what, what jim's asking is yeah. what is the trend is it getting better is it getting worse that's what you're asking actually today. as you saw there it's basically keeping along the same lines that we are below standard that that is out there and that, and again, the opportunity is, is that we do get a lot of breezy days and everything else. So we don't have like, like Los Angeles where we're in a basin and everything is collecting and holding and you're at the mercy of hopefully the weather comes along and, and blows it out. Can you give us the data? I thought those, that data was from like 2003 or something. That The stuff I showed you there was the last of what we had yeah. personally for the yeah. county and that everything else is state-based. So I, I can definitely reach yeah, out and ask them for and give you some data on that. Yes, sir. The industries that create air pollution don't aren't they required to have an air quality indicator at the industry? they do everyone that is a right. a permitted facility has recordings and all the rest of that if there's a violation in that they immediately have to report it to to the state and the feds and that again uh i have no notices that have come from any of the industries myself for any uh, violations of anything from from any of our major manufacturing facilities and that, and again, they self-report monthly to to uh, the state and federal agencies. And well, that, because again, one of the concerns they got is if you violate it, then you're putting your permit in jeopardy because you are in in violation of uh, of your actual uh, authorization to. One uh, of the problems is that um, research. You look at Google Scholar, 
and you look at scientific papers, mm -hmm. there are thousands or maybe tens of thousands pointing out that you're exposed to chronic low level exposure and that state or government standards are not adequately protecting from chronic low level exposure. Right. So all the particulates mm -hmm. trigger macrophages in the lungs, mm -hmm. which trigger systemic inflammation, right. which drives about five major health categories, heart disease, yeah. lung cancer, or cancer, uh, autoimmune disease, I mean, it just goes on, uh, right. diabetes and Alzheimer's. George, we're running out of time okay. on this subject, so I'm gonna let you finish and let's, we can all- Well, that's where you guys come in, just like everybody else in that, because again, those numbers come from the the federal and then down to the state, whether they adopt them or make them more stringent. And again, we can only enforce what is a regulation, what is a law, what is a criteria. And that's part of the problem is that funny enough, we got stuff right now that they're talking about rolling back to we, higher levels than lower levels. We can't regulate, but we can mitigate. And there are non-regulating right. ways that have been developed that were done in Boston. Well, again, you have a voice too to, you know, uh, to let people know uh, whether that's county, state, whatever. And again, they do have periods where you can make the comments on any one of these as they, they re-review, is it time to lower the standard, up the standard? And that's where it's definitely your, your voice is valuable to be, because again, that trickles back to us on what we enforce on a daily basis. And again, I can't go beyond what I have in black and white in front of me as that number. So, so definitely these are valuable uh, tools. The big problem we got right now is again, it comes down to to financial. Budget. Yeah, exactly. It comes down to budget. Mm -hmm. and, and again, because again, with the little unit, uh, again, I can identify a minor thing, but then I got to bring in the expensive equipment that we don't have to get the data that is certified and say, yes, verified, you have 20 parts per billion, and that's not acceptable. You're in violation of a uh, county, state, or federal level. George, isn't this new equipment, though, d uh, designed to handle that? Yes. Okay. Um, Aircoil, the company that makes one of the companies making these meters, uh, told me that they have a near reference standard. Okay. Uh, and that the, EP, the US EPA, um, even the Beijing EPA. Yeah, I want to see this. I apologize very much. We have one yeah, more yeah, important yeah, subject. Yeah. Yeah. Can, so, can, no, you no, send, can you send definitely send, send on? Send on. on. We, yeah. can, we can definitely yeah. inquire and investigate in that because. Yeah. Because I, I can tell you that uh, any of the handheld units, and that and I'm going back in a long history, not only in Canada but here in in Alaska County, and that handhelds generally are not going to be used legally for enforcement, for for even uh, recording a you know other than say we found it, and then let somebody else with the big equipment come in and, and search it. So just to give you uh, information on that, we did do a white paper, very in depth, showing uh, federal, state, county, what we did, where we are. And that, and we gave them four options to the commission and that, and the first option was obviously no status change to what we're doing now, where we've investigated every complaint uh, out there. We've resolved all of them and that without a air program uh, and that, and of course it, it is all received and accepted by state and federal EPA and that, and each one of those cases closed. Second one was to contract out with our environmental companies uh, and that, and the estimated cost, uh, this is over a year old and that, that bottom number's actually gone up a little bit with inflation. So I would say it's more like 15,000 to start and it could go up to 50 or 100,000 depending on what you're sampling for with a contract company. But the, the thing about that is yet they could go out and sample specifically in an area for a thing. But again, we're coming down to now it's a company in the business to make money too. So it's gonna come with an, ex an expense. Three, again, hire some dedicated air quality monitoring staff with equipment, estimated cost 400,000 initial, and then 125,000 a year uh, to support salary benefits and the equipment uh, that that one individual would use, or reestablish the full air program, which would probably be close to almost a million dollars for the initial kick, and then about 325,000 a year, vehicles, people, equipment. Uh, and again, all of that would have to come out of the general fund to support that program. Just as a reference, Stephen, what is what is EPD's full budget for I mean, the entire budget for EPD? Uh, it's about five million dollars. Okay. Yeah, so it's a big it's a big amount. Yeah, no, it's a substantial. So, so again, based on the current industry population, the you know, diminished amount of air quality issues that have have come through Alachua County, the state and federal, and budget limitations, 
we, we did stick with the initial uh, option and that which the commission uh, agreed with was status quo. I think we, we want to push that. What, I, what, what I'd like to do is when George sends you the information on that, yes, sir. if you look at that, you know, and, you know clear your mind before you do oh, no, and look at it on the grounds that, you know, this may be something, something that, that would change that Correct. and lower the, you know, it's a higher mm -hmm. cost for the equipment, but it might right. lower the cost of what we really need, you True. know, in terms oh, no. of ease of use or things that it provides to us. I'm, I'm always looking for another tool for the toolbox that makes our job easier and, and again, gives us something that we're, that's a benefit to the citizens. Right. And again, you know, that's the same thing with, uh, uh, I know I noticed a little bit of discussion about the microplastics and they are definitely going to become a huge upcoming yeah. issue. Uh, the big problem that we got with it is because it hasn't been really vetted out by uh, the EPA more than anybody, because they're going to set the federal standards of values and everything. I, I think we're going to see a lot of research and papers coming out of this, and it's in the early trends. And for an example, I gave you the forever chemicals, the PFAS, PFOS, PFOA, that comes from firefighting foam, but funny enough, it's not just foam. It's in everything that we touch that's got a non-stick. Your dental floss, your T-fall non-stick frying pans. If we took a blood sample right now, you would actually have PFAS verified in your blood. Problem we got with it is we've been using it more than 50 years. I, I can tell you in the early years when I started as a firefighter, not that, you know, I'm super old, but I'm old enough to, to have uh, played with just pair of hip waders and a trench coat, just like that draft. Yep. And, and that was it. That was our protection. And I've come out looking like the, the stay was at the, the big marshmallow puff marshmallow marshmallow man. guy looking away going, look at me, look at me. Again, because we're told no big deal. And again, it's, it's a huge issue. And there's already, you know, EPA's got a lot of tracking on this with the military bases, all the fire training academies, uh, the airports where every week they're training. So the big problem that we got is for the last 14 years, they've been talking about it really heavy, and we still don't have an actual groundwater threshold. Uh, they keep lowering it. I think we're down to four parts per trillion right now is the recommendation. Laboratories can't assess down to four parts per trillion currently. So you can see the problem with how they're trying to set the standard. There are so, too many things that go down to by trillion. It's usually about yeah, and again, if you've seen some of the articles, there's one that just came out the other day that, you know, they've measured Gainesville's water, and again, PFAS is already noted in it too. So it's coming, but microplastics will probably move a lot faster because we know they're in food and everything else. So I can see that trend, but the big thing with these is, yeah, we need numbers so that we have a regulation, we have a number, because uh, I enforce the numbers of ground, soil, and groundwater, surface water cleanups all the time with all of our spills that we have in the county and holding them to the task of cleaning it up to those standards. So that's just a little bit, like I say, uh, we'll get you the slides on that one so that, uh, again, you come up with stuff that you want to send to either me or to uh, Summer and that, and we'll definitely, uh, we'll, we'll definitely take it uh, to heart and, and yeah. research it. Yeah. That was a great presentation. That covered virtually everything we needed to know in, 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 in a small degree. So, uh, okay, well, I think we might need to push pause. Can we well, push let's pause? Go, yeah, I'm going to take a couple, a couple of minutes. How long will this take? Uh, there's quite a few slides in this one too, but yeah. I can motor through on this yeah, one. Yeah, motor through. Yeah. We're supposed to be closing at five. Does anyone here mind if we, you know, run a few minutes over? I'll okay. make it fairly quick. I, I actually, well, so I'm wondering if we could just, as you mentioned earlier, right. we're going to do a deeper dive. So I'm wondering if we should do the vote item in case people. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah. We'll do that first, I guess. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, in the presentation, um, I, I'm told that I went off, off, off script for that. And um, I wasn't aware I had to stay really tightly on a script, mind you. But um, you know, it gets gets our you know our, our you know wonderful EPD you know uh, people in trouble for us doing that. But um, what happened was is 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 there was one section we kind of left off of the the manual or not manual or our, our, our work plan for the coming year. And that item is something that's always been on it for like the last ten years, and that is. Um, and that's actually part of the subject that he's going to discuss with, um, was on the uh, um, uh, Cabot Coppers. You know, and I want to keep monitoring that. I don't want to just, you know, let that go aside. And so I added that back into the work plan, but I did it in like 10 before them, and we hadn't voted on that yet. Um, so the other item that, that I, I, I brought forth was the uh, air, air monitoring. And I feel that subject we really did, you know, cover because everyone knew that we had that in process because we scheduled this meeting with, with you know, Chris coming to, to talk about it, you know, last, that, you know, the last couple of months. So we knew that was going to happen. 
but um, still, let, let's take what we need to do is say based upon those two items. And is there any others that you want to see put back so in? So what I did was I went and, and it was fine going off script. It was just that it was writing. It was the writing on the work plan. So I went back yeah, to the yeah. meeting to see exactly what was written on the work plan. So those are the items in red line at the end. But so, they may not be what I wanted on there either. Right. Either. So I, want, I need you to take a look at it. Absolutely. So the back yeah. page of the work plan, you should have a copy. Do you have a yeah. copy? Um, I, I took the copies of the in email. red line. Yeah. So there was something in there that I, we might just want to nix, but yeah. it was written yeah. in. So I, the writings were sitting as I'm waiting to, you know, a couple minutes to go up and speak. You know, I, I penciled in a couple of things and, and they changed and might have a chance to think about where they should go. So we had so, air quality in there. We just hadn't specified using the portable meters. So I had added that in red line. Um, Cabot Coppers, that was a good catch, honestly, David, because we're yeah. all very interested in hearing about oh, that. Yeah, yeah. So, and then there was something about Orange County BMAP, and, and there was some discussion, and then I couldn't quite read the handwriting, and I think I wrote it on there because it was... It was probably Orange Orange, um, Orange, uh, or, or Creek, Orange Creek, Orange okay. Creek BMAP, okay. Okay. okay, which we always do and keep or, track of Orange as well. I, I go okay. to those and, okay. and, that was you know, and I have over time. That, so, and, and, and so the vote is to, you know, decide if it's, but it's not really a review right it's, it's not really a review it's just an accounting and it, it, it would be just an accounting of what what i you know usually i just say we had a meeting this year and i went to the meeting because they, they're now down to very few meetings but we're going to be due for another meeting real soon with them so okay um so, so I, you could actually leave that off and we could put it on but you know because only only i tend to go to those okay you know, i'll so. leave it off because it's going to be an update more than an action yeah, item then. yeah. and i don't remember discussing that with them but I, i'm sure i did you know. i know i had to go back and look too because and I, your handwriting is not yeah. quite as bad as mine yeah. so so we'll leave that you were able to read oh, my hand. oh i i want well, you not. to translate for me <laughs> I I, say, i've got i got a million sheets of paper i can't mine read is so bad <laughs> <laughs> um nobody can read mine i should have been a doctor um, okay, so that I'll go ahead and never mind that. But then, so the it, and it's an opportunity to take a quick look. So um, basically, we're specifying that we're going to look at look the air quality program using portable monitors, right? right so right, you, right. we wanted to be very clear that we're not talking about the whole five hundred thousand dollar shebang, but right, that we're really right. talking about the portable monitors. And actually, I just wanted to to kind of put them on notice that we were going to be looking into this more deeply, and we were going to come back to them with some kind of a proposal or other. Okay, I would be surprised if we don't, you know, but it's possible that we may look at all the data and say, okay, you know, we agree with you. There's no nothing we should do. You know, just keep, keep doing what we're doing. But um, I don't think that's going to be it, because I, I really see some value in having, you know, a a, you know, one of these portable monitors and someone dedicated to going around and using it in various locations around the county. But yeah, that definitely needs to go back on. Okay, so that's in there. I got rid of the, or the Orange Creek B map, and then so do, is that language sound right? Then evaluate mitigation of groundwater contamination. Yeah, yes, yes that's exactly that's there. exactly what it was about because we never got an update on that. You know, on what happened. You know that that the underground barrier that they made. You know, we never got an update on what that was like. We one of the last things we dealt. Now COVID came by and it just wiped our brains clean. <laughs> the stuff they injected was a beta tested product. Yeah. Manufactured yeah. by the company that polluted, from what I understand, was it Co um, Cabot or Coppers? Coppers, I believe. Well, they were both in operation out there. I'm not sure which one they the in situ uh, material that was injected, yeah. but I can find that out. And that, that we can. So can I get a, 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 a motion to um, add these two lines back to the with, with whatever modifications we just discussed um, back on and and, and um, Summer is going to go ahead and just add those back on. Just, it's not going to move to add the two lines back. Okay. So, a second. Sorry, I think yeah. the, a better motion might be to approve the work plan as amended. Okay. Or something along those lines. Okay, that's a better wording. Okay. That's a better wording. <laughs> See, now you know why I passed this <laughs> off to other people. <laughs> I second that motion. Now, do you want me to do it or do you want to do it? What? The, the, the modification. I think she's doing it right now. Um, I would just accept those changes that are right there in red line. Okay, so, good. yeah, that would be, yeah. that's why I say as. Because you know I'm not going to accept it. <laughs> Um, if you have one from your sign that has that change to it, uh, you know. Right, and I, I'm actually. And that's exactly not a change that needs approval. Right, that's not. Subsistence. Yeah, because you made it, you it made it in, in, in all of our in all of our these are, are you know. No, I just missed the other one. We're talking. We're just talking about you know 
part of the our, our letterhead, <laughs> which is um, trivial complaint. Okay. So, okay, so we you're, had making, a you're making the from other Richard. Do we have a second on that? Yeah, second yes. It. Okay, we have. Linda. A, okay, so any any further discussion on that? Um, you know. And, okay. A vote. And I do apologize for everyone for, for sticking that stuff in there because you know I guess I shouldn't have without. No, no, they're bad. good catches. It's not a big. It's thank yeah. you, David. I mean, you're. I mean, you were asked to go and give that presentation on behalf of everybody, and it's. I mean, it's a good reminder that we do have this process, and it's actually a good opportunity to kind of say yeah. that, like, when we do bring something to the commission, it does require a vote by the committee. You are always welcome on your own, and we've had this in the past where individual members have written letters um, from themselves. To the commission, and so we ha we have had that come across, and you're always welcome to do that. We're not by any means limiting your, you know, ability to communicate your personal opinion to the commission. But if it's if something that's on behalf of the committee, it's it's very specific as far yeah, as. Yeah. And, and I have more than three minutes. If any of you have ever spoken to the county <laughs> commission, you know how limited we are. So I had time to get in a few things that we would otherwise normally get. And uh, I, I think uh, you know anyone who's been on the committee long will, will know that I have I taken. Points of view before, before the the board of county commissioners, which I was in the minority and did not support, but I took it as if I supported it, and you know because that was my task at the time. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Wait, 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 wait. That's our our job to do that. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all in, we have no discussion further on this. Okay. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Opposed. Okay, no, no one's opposed then. I forgot there was somebody on there. <laughs> <laughs> Where is that coming from? Is there a ghost in this building? That was Jeff. However, Jeff's vote doesn't count. Yeah, yeah. Another good reminder. If you're not good here reminder, in person, not unless he unless he actually joins, you know, the committee right. sometimes. So. We appreciate your moral support. Okay, excellent. That that's done. So. Yeah, that's an important thing to underline. If there's a vote and you're not here, even if you're on Zoom. By the way, the question here is when someone is speaking for the board or you know for this board in front of the board of county commissioners, it's important that the person who's doing the speaking is speaking for the board and not making stuff up on their own. Okay, so that's why we, we brought this forward brought back here. So can we continue with the, the last bit here? I think we so yeah. the question that uh, came up is uh there's 39 slides and there's quite, probably going to be quite a bit of discussion with the information that's going to be presented with us so it it, it wouldn't do you fair justice of yeah. anything less than at least an hour plus on this presentation do you want to uh move that to the next meeting and get the full the full delivery of that and plus we can get the yeah. additional information that was asked uh and that yeah. on uh, one of the chemicals yeah. if it's going to take that long yes but how long how much time do we have in our next meeting we don't have anything on that agenda yet for the we next don't. meeting is the typical two hours. There was the climate vulnerability study that, that we had kind of wanted to right, put on this agenda right. that got bumped. And also Gus has offered to come and give his solid waste right, right. going dance. But I think we could probably fit Gus and okay. you. Um, so so let's, let's fit that in the next month. Okay. The, by the way, we're, one of the things we need to do tonight is um, we've, been, we've been offered to do a tour of the Southeast um, uh, um, C and D facility, you know, the, the place where they actually the landfill, okay, the Florence landfill, and also the what's the name of the other location they have? I think it's on. The, I think it's. You have the owner here. Yes. Yes. Watson C and D is in uh, Archer. Correct. Okay. And we're Florence in the southeast side. Right. right. And, and the other one is what is a merge for that, or you have you're you're all in one. The only one with the C and D transfer station. Okay, so you're. So the we have a transfer station and the landfill. Okay. And then Watson just has the landfill. Okay. So but we were offered, a, a, you know, to a an opportunity to to tour those, and those are somewhat complicated to set up, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, I'll leave a for, I'll leave another tour for another meeting to do. Um, what we would do is it would be scheduled on a non-meeting day, sometime in the next month. And by the way, we sometimes do that. And what we have to do is we have to advertise the meeting as a uh, a subcommittee meeting for this, you know, committee. But it's open to the public. So a lot of times, you know, people who, who offer to give us tours say, oh, I don't want, you know, I don't want that. But very rarely would I think of someone come and join us. So, um, you know, what we want to do, first of all, see, should we do this as, you know, as a, as a, as a committee? I mean, is that something we want enough of us want? What would to be our purpose? 
<laughs> I mean, uh, I, I, information is obvious, but information to be used how? Yeah, the, the purpose is basically there's a permit coming up. Maybe can you give us some information? We're up for repermitting in January for our special use permit for our landfill. We're not asking for any changes or amendments in our permit. It's just renewing the current permit we have. Is it going to allow it to go? We have that high? approved. Yeah, 2019. Okay. So that's already been, our height has been approved. It's just a renewal, basic renewal permit. Mm -hmm. Staff can ask us for any additional information they want, or right. you know, if they're happy with the information they have, then we, it's just a basic renewal. This is your special use permit. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. So you've got the it's DEP fine. permit and the special use permit, yeah. and every yeah. five years we've yeah. got to renew right. the special use permit. And so this is going to come up before the committee, uh, the, the, the BOCC win next month. No. September, I think, is when oh, we September. start okay. submitting information okay. to be November, November to December. December. Okay, yeah, so yeah. we can schedule this for some time this month and then, you know, discuss it next month. There's some people, there's, there's citizens who live, like, right on the outs of the source of this, and some are for, you know, giving the permit and some are opposed to it. I've talked to some of each, okay? So we need to listen to both sides of the situation. We've got Holly that's going to yes. can give and us the I inside scoop the, on it. Um, Sue Michelle, Sue Mache, I can't ever say her name correctly. Right? Yes, yeah, she, she Mache, came yeah. out and actually toured our facility last Monday. We go, you know, I think we came to not an agreement, but she got a lot of information from us that she didn't have before. Yeah, yeah. So she said the DOCC meeting the other day. Yeah. With us. yeah. So that was good. We yeah. encourage anyone that has any questions or problems with anything we do. I mean, do we have any questions? Check us out. Yeah, no so the first question is: Does do the committee feel we need to go and do this? Or well, not? Can I ask what's sure. the special permit for? For the landfill space to continue landfill our landfill space. operation, so construction and demolition. Okay, right. and what does it specify for you? To be able to continue operation with our county permit. Does it give depths of dig or anything like that? Well, we've already, we're not asking for any yeah. so special. Holly, I would right. like to you put yourself in a. <laughs> can, can you give us a situation? situation? Don't we have, sure. we have right. a real conflict potential here, don't we? Yeah, we do. We do. Yes, we do. That's why I'm, I'm jumping in. So yeah. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, there were modifications to their permit. Um, they got approved in 2019. Permit. It elevated it to 195. Foundation now. Um, they are not likely going to ask for any modifications of what they were already approved in 2019. And the state just recently approved that same elevation that they're currently um, have already with the county. So they're they but they are still required to come mm -hmm. in every five years. And there's a possibility that you know modifications and conditions can be added or modified. Um, to address any concerns that exist at that time. So, um, and it's nothing unique to, to Florence. It's with all CD landfills, we have a five year renewal requirement right. um, to renew those permits. And they, uh, as, as I said, they also have to have state permit uh, as well. Um, uh, how many landfills do we have? So, Go ahead. so we have, <laughs> in fact, actually, if you all are interested, if we uh, are. Uh, solid waste director just gave a presentation on Tuesday to the board about our CDs. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very informative um, presentation that I would recommend you guys. It was an excellent watch. presentation. And, and, it, and it had some offer. comments. Yeah, yeah so, he did offer to do that. We were going to try yeah. and squeeze it in at this meeting, but it kind of seems like that might be a good thing to look at. So I, I'd recommend doing that. We have two CDs formerly. We have some other facilities that, that can. Um, Take material and transfer them, sort them and transfer. I wouldn't, they're not full DD landfills like Watson and Florence. Um, we do not have full landfills in our county. We take our trash outside of the county to the New River landfill. Um, the county does not handle CD, it is done privately through groups like Florence. Um, there's a discussion of that. Possibility. One of the scenarios was that the county could look at a possible location for a CD. Um, that was an option described. That's not currently an option. Um, so I don't think the board made a motion to do that. It was I one of the considerations that, yeah. that got talked so, about saying. But so, I, so I'd yeah. recommend watching that to get a good idea of the options. Absolutely. And, and there's there's significant capacity of the two. CD landfills now for, for 20. Okay, sorry. Construction and demolition debris. 
Okay. So construction and demolition debris is a limited area of waste material. It's basically what you have when you tear down or construct sites. So it's the wood material, it's the brick, concrete, um, wall materials. It could even be vegetative material that is cleared for the site, brick, concrete. Um, so it doesn't include household waste, it doesn't include hazardous materials. Um, so you can't, you should not be throwing a bag of garbage from your, your, your household waste into one of those bins that are for CMB because that contaminates that CMB material. So what um, Florence does is they have a facility where they separate that material out and take the stuff that doesn't qualify for CMB. That stuff gets separated out either reused for another purpose or taken to a landfill. The CMB material that they can't reuse then gets taken to their um, site. Uh, and that, so they have a permit for that site for a certain capacity. And currently, from what we understand, and, and Holly can correct this since I think it's just a factual statement, they have capacity over 20 years under their current permit. Well, and that's at the current rate of construction. So, right. that's so if the economy bombs and nobody's building anything, it could last longer. Or if things boom twice as much as they're doing now, it would fill yeah. faster. Yeah. So it's all kind of relative. And the more you can recycle out of that, too, right. gives the longer life. So this will also, by the way, give us all a chance to see the different options that were being put before the Board of County Commissioners yesterday. And there were other options for what the county might do in the future in terms of opening up, you know, CND. So, really, this county for several years now has been working very hard to see what they can do up in the um, uh, the eco, you know, uh, loop area. They want to be able to, you know, we're, we're obligated, you know, uh, have obligated ourselves, you know, the county has, uh, along with the city, to zero waste programs. And the idea is, is what can we do to not just get rid of these items by putting them in the ground? What can we do in terms of recycling these? So there's some consideration on that. We can't really know what the, you know, the best solution is, you know, make a recommendation on it if we haven't looked at well, what I they're think doing. also as a board, not just tour us, tour Watson. Go to Florida Concrete, yeah. go to the steel oh, yeah. yards around town. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, big picture I think idea. That's, I think that's very important. And Holly, this is in no right. way directed Absolutely. at you, and I apologize for bringing up an issue like this on your no. first. It's <laughs> okay, you can take it. I grew up going to county commission meetings yeah, as a kid. Yeah. This, this sounds, um, it's probably fine, but it doesn't look fine that a member of our committee and the committee yeah. in general go to visit a facility that's got a pending permit. I don't see a problem with visiting it. What I see a problem with is if we get anything other than if I ask, if, if any one of us wants to ask, you know, how a question regarding status, but but she, she's not allowed to come in other than that and they're not allowed to vote on that. She's gonna have to file the exact form that he was right. showing us tonight because it's definitely any anything would be it. and yeah, if she doesn't know. file that then she can't you know continue to comment. I don't know we have to decide this tonight, but it's not a perfect thing to send to the attorney his opinion upon him. By the way, I'm a builder and I used them for a long, long time. They yeah. sound very good, I think. I'm sorry, what, okay, what, so what was your, what's your point again? I want to make sure I'm talking about the attorney. Oh, yes, 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 definitely, definitely. Holly, how um, much more difficult or yeah. easy would it be to, if we contacted you for individual tours? That's fine. Given there's 12 of us. Yeah. About how long does a tour take? I mean, it depends on how much information well, people want. But then that's the idea she's, all, yeah. we took three people around Monday, it was four hours. She okay. can't do the so, tour and for she can't them. do, she can't do the tour. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's yeah. a question too for the attorney. I didn't think EPAC had a position about pending permits for <clears throat> landfills to advise the board. In we, the past, you know, like Watson just got approved, did this board if we think it affects you know the environment, we, we have an obligation. I didn't know to, if that yeah. was a, even would, in our capacity to do that. It, it, like I would think that our purpose in doing this would not be to weigh in on whether we think right. it's a good thing or not, but just get educated about, you know, right. see what, what mm -hmm. it looks like, what, you know, whether it was Florence or Watson, I right. think, you know, it would be good. I think. Or a new this is if this is what we deal in, we should probably see it. I mean. If, we have an opportunity to do it, let's say. And Gus now, offered I would say to tourists. We could put it off till October, November, because going yeah. to a landfill in it's August. Hot. <laughs> I mean, it's really hot. 
<laughs> not high on my list, yeah. but I do it anyway. Well, Gus, Gus offered a tour of Levita Brown too. Right, correct. Yes. Right. If, that, if that's easier to organize, that's just an option that maybe we do one that's easier and then just like. I hate to be the naysayer around here, but we can't anticipate that some environmental issue around landfills of any sort isn't going to be an issue that comes to I foresee it happening for oh, without too. a doubt. <laughs> and the fact that we have a history as a committee of visiting one, no disrespect. Right. Uh, just put, it seems to me it puts us in a vulnerable place that's going to complicate subsequent discussion of this I issue agree. if it comes up. I could. When it we, could. Maybe two of our members. But we have a process for dealing with that. Not able to Jay, we have a process, a, a legal and correct process for dealing with it. And that is, and I, by the way, I think the community is, is knows, knows how this committee operates and has seen it operating long enough to know that, you know, we're not going to be doing something, you know, that is, uh, that is, it is, you know, well, you, could, I, be, could I, be labeled you corrupt. A, okay? I think you make an excellent point and a, a really good one. But we got the expert who said, hey, call me. Let's call him. He's, he's the guy. Yeah, that's, and, that's, 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 that, that's part of the question. It's, the question still remains. Because regardless of what is said by even by EP, ED staff and and you know Corbin is a member of EPD staff, no matter I look at it, do we feel that there is enough reason for us? To, is there enough for us to learn just by going and to looking at the uh, the landfill to make it worthwhile for us? Now we can require as a term of that you know visit that you know that Holly can't actually be on that tour, okay, and that she has to you know file, you know, the part of form of conflict and not participate uh, in our in our meetings in any other way than answering specific questions that we ask and nothing more. And I and I, I know what you're getting at, Jay, but I don't think this this committee has ever had a problem with anyone pointing to them and say, oh look at them, EPAC, they're you know, they're playing, you know, playing games with the, you know, with with quote the enemy, you know, not that I you know record to keep in touch. Yeah. Well I, I do too. You know, and and you know, with all you know, due respect, I have a very lot number of years of my time spent here, a lot of dedication to this committee oh, that I, I'm not willing to risk. Okay? We refer this to the well, no, I I can't refer the whole thing to it. That we refer this at the aspect of what was required of. I mean, that's my opinion. Okay, I'm you know, I re, we wait, I, I apologize. I'm out of order. It needs to be someone needs would need to second that first. Sorry, yeah, sorry, well, I just I want to clarify. Revise the motion, Thank right, you. So that, that we refer to the attorney for his opinion. Opinion. Okay. Yes, okay. On the tour? On the tour. Yeah, on the tour, tour okay. specifically. Okay. Yeah, okay, the motion that. has been seconded. Any discussion on that? I would just like to say, has anybody in here been in construction besides me and uh, Jan? Jan. Jan. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of. I mean, you obviously, <laughs> because you live it. But so the, none of you have been to a site that does this kind of work before. So then it would be beneficial for you to see how that, those sites function. Or even if not a tour, you could get myself or different facilities to just come and present to you, show pictures of the site, give a that's, basic that idea, is, fine right a there. flow chart if it's too difficult to get people to come tour. You could that may be the better speak. option if mm -hmm. she can get pictures and give a, a, a presentation. I mean, it's, it's different than a hands-on, but like he said, it's hot right now. Walking through a CND site is going to be hot it's going to be boring, <laughs> and you're not going to see a lot that she can't show you on a picture. Yeah, we, I got the truck tour at Watson because I was <laughs> in Florida. We're not going to be doing much better until October, right? You know? And I and I don't think we really want to wait until then. And by the way, I'm the most heat sensitive or you know sensitive person in the world. Okay, partially because of my age, and partially because I'm just you know getting. Well, it's all because of my age. Okay, but. Um, you know, I mean, we can't afford to wait till October and still have, you know, formed a proper opinion on this, can we? Well, we've got well, a motion yeah. on the table. Well, if, if, as an alternative, the president, of, I'm willing to, I don't, I don't know how you put Robert's rules order in, but if, if the committee wants to consider a presentation here instead of a visit, I can. That's a different, that's a different motion, and this one's already been seconded, okay? Yeah. Now, you can request to recall it, and then we'd have to vote on it. You know, to allow that recall. That's the only. If it hadn't been seconded, then you wouldn't have to. You could just withdraw. Yeah. 
but um, I, 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 since we're in discussion, I would argue that that's not what I'd like to see. I want to see us go on that. I think that's a good motion that's already existing yes. for future purposes. Exactly. And I would like to make a motion that we have Holly or you can't make, uh, well, you, not Holly yeah. or another person from Holly. You cannot make a new motion. You can you can amend his motion. You cannot make a new motion. Well, the motion. No, is I'm not, it's not the same, same motion. Yeah, but you can't make a new motion. You can amend his motion while his motion is still on the table, and, and but you cannot make a new motion. Okay. Okay. Until we, vote, until we vote. Until we vote. Oh, okay. Until we have a motion. Until we vote. Until we vote. Until we vote. Until we vote. The easiest yeah. thing okay. would be to vote on the current motion. And if it's a no, then you can okay. take it back. Right. So gotcha. the motion is to ask the attorney. Um, I think we're all just wanting to get the hell out of here. The it. ability to do this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Me too. Me too. Yeah. 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 So the way I have it written, that you re said refer to the attorney in the tour. This was seconded by Richard. And so the next thing up would be a vote. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So any other, is there any further? Next question is if there's any further discussion Thank you. on that. That's why you're the expert. Not okay. I'm just the liaison. <laughs> okay. There's no further discussion. Here, no further discussion. We'll vote. All in favor of putting the issue before uh, Corbin or whatever staff they choose to assign to for an opinion um, on, you know, on not on whether we should go, but on, you know, what we need to do about having a member, you know, that's actually, who actually has worked, works for, you know. Wait a minute. What? What did you just say, David? We're not going to get an opinion on whether we should go. No, for this meeting, not not in this motion. This motion has nothing to do with that. Am I? No, I, I just wondered yeah, what we that declaration. We want an opinion about the legality road, the sunshine line. Yeah. 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 Right. That's right. Not whether that's we should true. go or not. Right. Yeah. Right. We so that's say, that's the motion. Yeah. That's the motion we're going to vote on. Okay, good. Right. <laughs> oh, yes. okay. All in favor of the motion? Because he said nothing. Yet. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Anyone opposed? Say beer. Okay. No, no one's. Uh, yeah. So would you like that I asked? I mean, Gus offered. I told him we were plenty busy, but Gus did offer to give us the same presentation that he gave the commission yeah. on July 10th. Would you would you all like me to try and schedule that for the next meeting? Well, I think I think it would be just as good if every for that. I think yeah. if, if everyone listened to the meeting, because then you'd hear yeah, all the all the, you know the comments yeah. that people made. Okay. I was there for what for what it's worth. Okay, so and I was going to make that same recommendation that we all you know go watch the meeting. So um, now, uh, do we have another motion on the table to actually make a tour? Or oh, no. For, for Florence. We, for just, Florence. we just approved a motion to get an opinion from the t attorney. No, no, we? that had to do with, with whether whether Holly, you know, what, what Holly needs to do, whether it's a conflict of interest and whether she needs to do blah, blah, blah. Okay. We haven't voted on anything about whether we do a tour yet. That's the next question. I have the motion as refer to the attorney about the tour. Yes. No, for that's an the motion said, that that no, he, about he, the tour. You're very careful. Right? said yeah. for an opinion by right. by that. I, I don't see where the point. I don't want. Jan, what was your motion? Well, it was as simple as you said it, but I was implying that relative to legal sun, which would be the sunshine law. I mean, I, I think I was implying that. So if you want to add add that detail, if it doesn't anybody, they, I think it's an important detail because I would not have voted for it under the circumstances. I thought I was voting for one thing, and that's to get the attorney's opinion on whether we need to have how I, um, you know. That wasn't um, the motion. Yeah, I didn't, that wasn't what I was Jay, I'm sorry. I, I'm just saying I misunderstood if that was if that was it. Okay, and I, I thought we had clarification. I guess it was a fuzzy. It wasn't a very clear motion. And and that's okay. Okay, We're, I think we have under that under that particular circumstance you know we can void that motion or you know and say there's no okay we but we need to vote on that okay because i would i would not have voted for it and i think other people may have or may not have can i change your vote yeah. then do you want me to change your vote well let's let's look and well, see you know let's, i want to redo the entire I vote think he's right because i also took it as the uh issue with holly being in her position not for the tour itself well she would be in her position on the tour giving us the tour no, there's a conflict no, of interest not, no, with Holly. Be able to give us that's what either. we're talking about is the you know, conflict of interest with Holly, right. not just in this tour, but in the future. Okay. On the these motion topics. was open ended. Can we just leave it open ended and see what he says? I mean, yeah, that's how I yeah. Is there a way of edge sketching? <laughs> here, I mean, honestly, here's, here's, the, here's the problem. I, I don't I don't want yeah. to 
put in anyone else's hands what this committee does as long we're as it is. Him. We're only asking him what does he think of. Yes, and that's how I heard it. Do it. I mean, that's how I heard it. That's how I heard it. I was thinking for the tour because, like, would it be better if we went individually? If we went all the same? If Holly didn't give the tour? So I was thinking yeah. meant the just the sunshine legality of the logistics of the tour. Yeah, but, but I have a very compartmentalized. I, I failed to say that, which I should have done. I think open ended is good enough. I mean, and it's been passed. Let Let somebody say, okay. Maybe I, somebody can make a motion to rescind it. I don't know. No, no, no. I, I'll tell you what. I will leave it off for right now, okay? Um, it's, yeah. it's, I, I'll tell you how this... Originally, when I got the invitation to do the tour, uh, I was just going to go myself, and I was going to report to everyone else, okay? Because that, to me, seems... Because I, I tried to set up tours like this, or not tours, but, but things like this before, where it required you know, us to all organize... And it didn't work so well, and that's why I recommended originally that I go by myself. But, 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 um, you know, I, and I, and believe me, I respect staff's opinion on this. And their their opinion to me was, and the recommendation to me was that I, you know, I that the whole committee, you know, should be asked, to, you know, if they want to do it. Stephen has uh, wanting to say something. Yeah, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> My only point is, I think the only person that can modify the motion is the person who gave it. Yes, that's true. Right. That's true. No one else can do anything about it. The motion that's true. Passed. So okay. if, if the person who gave the motion now feels it wasn't clear, you can adjust. I'm happy with it. Okay. Just yeah, ask if it's been enough. What does he think? That's all. In the motion and I think he'll, he'll, he'll probably tell us what he thinks mm -hmm. about all aspects yeah. of that. So leave it at that. If that's okay, you know, okay. whether it is or not, somebody. Can, I'll will, give Corbin the whole shebang. I will. Yeah. Probably, I'll give him the whole shebang. I will yeah. probably choose to go <laughs> on a, go on a tour myself. Okay, one to do, and we already arranged this. I, or, you know, with the possibility of doing this with Meg Niederhofer, and you know that I would go and that her and or Hutch and or the the you know you have, I, yeah, so other people other than her because they knew at the time that she was a member of this committee. Who's Meg Niederhofer? Yeah, uh, Hutch's uh, wife. Who? Hutch. He's a, Robert, he was, Robert he Hutchinson. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, former commissioner. He's also a, um, the arborist for the city. Yeah. So I was going to go and I was going to present, you know, present my findings and then other people would be, you know, obviously, you know, uh, could, could make their own arrangements to do tours. They understand that that was, you know, an option that we might come to because they understood also, you know, being who they are, how complex something like that can be to do. So, um, but you know, I, I, I must say it wasn't this wasn't my first choice to do it this way because of exactly what just happened. <laughs> and I tried to head it off at the pass, okay? I, I apologize, but you know, it's tries to cut, cut, cut off already. No, no, head it off. I tried to prevent this being an issue here and making it, you know, everyone could make their own appointments to go on tours. Isn't this a dead horse? Yeah. Well, okay. I just want to say too, I, I'm, I'm excited on. about being part of this committee and I feel like I have a lot of knowledge about solid waste, not my site particularly, but obviously, but just of the state and growing up and seeing how landfills have evolved and how permitting is involved and water monitoring. And we need, as a homeschooled child, my parents would read me the water monitoring reports for our landfill in Archer. So I grew up, I mean, this is like, that's how I learned statistics. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Doing things like this. I, I'm looking forward to sharing a lot of the stuff that I know from the industry growing up, not just particularly about my place, but about you know everywhere in the county. Let me ask. Let me ask just an informal question. We're not going to vote on this, okay? Tonight, the issue is closed tonight for as far as voting. But do people generally would they prefer going on one one as you know single in, you know individual going on a on a tour or with people that maybe aren't on this committee on the tour? Would that be something that you'd be you, that you would rather see us pursue that as as opposed to a group tour? I personally would pursue the presentation avenue. I don't think a physical visit to the site is going to be of any greater use. What do you think of what you think? I think a presentation would be, you'd probably get more information out of it because really? when you're on the site, it's, you know, people are hot, they're antsy, right. they're, you know, no one wants to stand around. It's, it, here it's more controlled, you can have pictures. Yeah. statistics slides where it's a little more controlled and i totally disagree so, with that point of view because i mean you could have videos or you know if you could request certain pictures of things you'd like or videos of things you'd like but sure take care i'm sorry that's if, just you know, my opinion no it'd be easier to do a presentation of this 
And then from then, if people wanted to tour and they had more questions, mm -hmm. that would be an option. Yeah, sure. Maybe give a basic one first. Yeah. Okay. Can you remember when you're on site, you can't talk about it. But then the question would be, can Ollie give that presentation? We can talk amongst ourselves if we've made it published. You want to No, he said we no? can't. He said we can't. Oh, we have to talk about it. I mean, that took the wind out of my sail. I can only tell you that that wasn't, that wasn't, that wasn't, that wasn't the case when we toured, you know. Guys, violent. <laughs> I was not expecting that. I had never heard that before. I was shocked to hear that. You know, yeah. we'll see, no, we will I will double check that with him as well. I'm going to that, that, that was many, many, down. many years ago. Right. <laughs> yeah. Can I make another minute? That we also asked the attorney, what about Holly giving a presentation? Not on her Great place, idea. but on this specific what she, you know, information she has. I think we, yeah. It, Let's let's make that simple. And can is it can we still ask Holly questions if you know she, if it's a conflict of interest for her? I think okay. by the way we could only talk to her about it if it is considered to be a well, a conflict of interest. Otherwise, yeah. it's only it's only a conflict of interest that applies directly to her business. Yeah. If it's a general understanding that you're looking for, that's not a conflict of interest. Right. He also I, I could see it possibly somewhere down the line reaching that. So well, I can't. Maybe we don't I, need well, at some point, she may have to recuse herself. I mean, they're, they're, like, she might have to recuse herself at some point. Huh? If there's a vote or something, she she would have to recuse herself. I'm going to leave this up to staff to present it to, to you know to Corbin so that you all don't you know tar and feather me if it if it comes out other than how you want to hear it. You know, because because there's some confusion about how you know, but how this this motion what it, what it really meant, and that's not your fault. Well, and no, it's, it's my fault, I guess, for not clarifying. No, it's general. I, again, I think it's fine being general. Let's agree. Yeah, just leave it yeah. up at the desk. Yeah. Yeah. We're not, nobody's going to get sued about it. So we'll just wear, what do you say? I think it's a very good motion. It's a good idea. We'll ch I'll check yeah. the whole ball of wax. Um, so for the next meeting, and I'll bring um, Chris back to do the cabinet yes, poppers. Too. But we don't want to hear from Gus yet. Is that do I got that? Or no, you and I will talk. We don't you and I will talk. Well, Gus has offered to present oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. his. Yeah his typical presentation that he gave to the commission or we can yeah. watch the video but i think you know i think if everyone watches then we can solve the same mainly yeah, because, appreciate that, because you know we're going to put him to work when we get a tour of you know yeah of, levita of, brown yeah. yes yep yeah okay okay god i will give corbin the whole i'm thinking of life insurance policy i'm giving the whole follow wax to corbin we'll have a long conversation i'll make sure somebody else is in on the conversation i'll record it i'll <laughs> Yes, I realize that. Jeff has. What about? What do we have a question with Jeff? No, just no. the adjournment. Okay, meetings adjourned. That's All, right. All right. <laughs> yeah, vote with your feet. <laughs> vote with your feet. Yes. Yes. Thank you. This is a rowdy bunch. I'm the one keep up with you guys. Oh heck, if that's rowdy, if that's rowdy. <laughs>